Kicking off at number 5, the Kaz 2, which perhaps is one of the most terrifying modern instances of the term ghost ship and one of the most profoundly tragic unsolved mysteries of the deep blue sea. The Kaz 2, which was publicly dubbed the ghost yacht, was a 9.8 meter catamaran which was found drifting listlessly 88 nautical miles off the northeastern coast of Australia on the 20th of April 2007. The three men aboard, who were all residents of Perth in Western Australia, were all incredibly experienced sailors. There were 56 year old Derek Batten and brothers Peter Tunstead and James Tunstead who were 69 and 63 respectively. Their whereabouts still remains a mystery to this day and the fate of these three men perhaps may never be known. What made it even stranger is that when the Kaz 2 was eventually found by the Coast Guard, there were no signs of distress, no signs of boat damage or even a struggle between the three men. It was as if they just vanished out of thin air. Coffee cups were left out and all the life jackets on board remained stowed away, indicating that the trio never felt at risk. In an even more curious turn of events, rescue teams discovered video footage of the three men on a handheld camera, seemingly hours before they disappeared. It showed them fishing, relaxing in the sun with the motor off and offered no clues as to how these three experienced sailors disappeared at sea. Although an inquiry was later drawn, no definitive conclusions were ever reached and only theories remain about the ultimate fate of the Kaz 2. Coming in at number 4. Or the Lady Lover Bond. Of course, no list would be complete without a good old sea shanty of jilted lovers and ghostly revenge. As the legend goes, the Lady Lover Bond was a schooner that is alleged to have been wrecked on the Goodwin Sands just off the southern coast of Kent on the 13th of February 1749. But if you ask any old sailor worth their salt, they'll tell you that it just so happens to have a habit of reappearing every 50 or so years as a ghost ship. As the story goes, the captain of the ship, a man named Simon Reed, had just been married to his bride. Anetta and was celebrating the joyous occasion with a cruise bound for Oporto in Portugal. Now it is high time to mention that a long standing sailor's superstition was that back in the day it was grave bad luck to bring a woman on board and in many ways the legend of the Lady Lover Bond is a cautionary tale that exemplifies that fact. According to the tale the ship's first mate a man named John Rivers was a rival for the hand of the captain's young wife and in a jealous fit of rage he killed the crewman manning the ship's wheel and steered the vessel into to the treacherous Goodwin Sands, killing absolutely everyone on board. And if you're asking me, that is a stark overreaction. But nevertheless, since that fateful day in 1749, the Lady Lover Bond has been sighted on numerous occasions with an ethereal, ghostly glow, eternally bound to wander the ocean. Coming in at number three, we've got the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait. Yes, Canadian ghost pirates. That pretty much sums up my career aspirations right there. I don't know if that means I would be pirating software related to ghosts or actually becoming a phantom upon the Northumberland Strait, but I don't really care as long as my title involves the words Canadian, ghost, and pirate. But back to the actual tale at hand. This ghost ship is said to sail when it's on fire within the Northumberland Strait. What is the Northumberland Strait? It is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in eastern Canada. Now you all know some Canadian geography. I'm so proud of you. The story dates back over 200 years when people started reporting a beautiful schooner catching fire and being engulfed in flames as people watched from shore. Anyone who has ever attempted a rescue mission finds that the ship completely disappears before they can reach it. Apparently the ship shows up before a northeast wind, forewarning terrible storms. Some say it's just an example of St. Elmo's fire, a rare weather condition involving the ionization of air molecules in order to produce a faint glow, but those who have seen the ship ablaze say that it was much too bright to be explained away like that. The prevailing story is that a pirate made a pact with the devil to protect and hide his treasure, and in return, he and his crew would sail forever on the burning ship. A pact was made as the ship was burning down and would soon sink along with the treasure. In the end, folks claim that their fate was revenge for the terrible deeds they had done in their days of piracy, like their own personal floating hell. Coming in at number two, we have Baron Falkenberg. A tale of lovers scorned, brothers bashed, and dice rolled. This pirate haunts Germany's North Sea and has been for over 600 years. Baron Falkenberg was a relatively wealthy member of high society, planning to propose to the village's most beautiful maiden. Then his long lost brother returned with newly found riches and proposed to her first. At the wedding, the Baron became so upset with his brother that he clubbed him over the head with a bottle of champagne. Classy. Naturally, the brother dropped dead. Seeing this, his bride ran away, claiming that she'd rather die than be with the Baron. Ouch. So the Baron did what any rational fratricidal maniac would do and stabbed her in the heart. 
How romantic. Then he ran away to the beach where he was accosted by a shady man on a boat. This mysterious figure invited him to the ship where he came from, which was anchored offshore a little ways out. The Baron accepted and rode his way to the great grey behemoth. Since entering, nobody has seen him disembark and he's been at sea for centuries. The ship he boarded always seems to be heading due north and flickers of blue flame. Some passers-by claim to have seen the Baron himself playing dice with the devil in order to take back control of his soul. Unfortunately, it appears to be very difficult to win a game of chance against the devil. An additional caveat that can be added is that there are those who will claim that the story of the Baron is also connected to a Norse ghost story. The story tells the tale of a Viking sea captain who stole a magic ring from the gods. As punishment for his crimes, he was turned into a living skeleton covered in fire, condemned to spend the rest of eternity affixed to the mast of a ghostly longship. Whether the two stories are about the same ship, it's hard to say. However, I think we can all agree that a flaming skeleton pirate is pretty badass. And finally at number one, we have the Flying Dutchman. We saved the most well known for last. The legendary ghost ship is said to glow with ghostly light as it sails the seven seas. It will attempt to send messages to land or to people long dead if hailed. Unfortunately, nobody really wants to hail this ship as the sight of it is seen to be a portent of doom. Like most ghostly ships, the Dutchman can never make port and is doomed to sail the oceans forever. It's theorized that the spectral seafarer had been rounding the treacherous Cape of Good Hope when it encountered a sudden storm. The hatches were battened down and the captain swore he would push right through come hell or high water and it turns out a little bit of both were on the menu. For his recklessness with his ship and crew, the captain was divinely punished. He was condemned to sail the seas for eternity, serving as a warning to other mariners of bad weather and the cost of hubris. Sightings of the Dutchman have been reported since the 18th century with many notable scallywags and scurvy dogs laying eyes on the ghastly vessel. Even Prince George of Wales described seeing a ship glowing with a strange light. If you see a ship with skeletons dancing in the rigging, steer clear. It might look like fun, but the captain will try to lure other vessels onto the rocks to ensure nobody else can pass the cape. Sheesh, remind me not to take a long sailing trip. Number five on this list is the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie, as many people refer to this creature, is said to be a huge, long-necked, almost dinosaur-looking creature that lives in Scotland. This creature of the deep specifically resides in Loch Ness, a 37 kilometer loch located in the Scottish Highlands. The legend of this sea creature went worldwide back in 1933. A photo was released to the public showing a strange creature's head protruding from the water of Loch Ness. The world went into a frenzy after that photo got out and the legend of Nessie began. Ever since that point, many sightings have been reported, other pictures have been taken, and even sonar readings have indicated this creature swimming in the loch. All of that being said though, we've never had indisputable proof that Nessie's real. Well, I'm here to tell you that Nessie is real, but maybe not how you expect. New Zealand scientists have taken samples of the water in Loch Ness and have studied the DNA that they found in it. Professor Neil Gamel, a geneticist, is quoted saying, well, our data doesn't reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material that says we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness Monster might be a giant eel. So, the Loch Ness Monster, as we understand it, might not be real, but potentially this loch is full of giant eels that resemble all the features that Nessie's reported as having. Maybe this is why we've had such a hard time proving this myth, because for years, people have been looking for the wrong thing. I really like the legend of the Loch Ness Monster and honestly want it to be true, but if it had to be giant eels, then I think I could accept that as well. Number four on this list is the USS Stein Monster. The USS Stein was a Knox class destroyer ship in the United States Navy. The ship was eventually decommissioned from the American Navy and was transferred to the Mexican Navy in the 90s. That wasn't before it was attacked by a massive sea monster though. In 1978, the USS Stein was attacked by an unknown entity which we now refer to as the USS Stein Monster. This monster was said to have been a giant, with some people estimating its size up to 150 feet in length. The ship was sailing in the Pacific Ocean when it was attacked. Technical difficulties with the ship started going wrong and eventually they brought it back into the port. 
Upon inspection, the sonar system was completely damaged. There were cuts and gashes over 8% of the ship, with some of them being massively deep. They also found suction cups like those of a squid attached to the ship. After investigation of the suction cups and the gashes, it became clear that what they were attacked by isn't your standard animal. Even a giant squid would have had a hard time doing what the monster did to the ship. Ever since that point, the legend of the USS Stein monster has grown. Obviously, this monster has to be real because it has actually attacked a ship. Sadly, we don't know a whole lot about it though. In truth, we know less about what's on the ocean floor than we do about the surface of the moon. So it's very possible that a creature we aren't familiar with yet is dwelling down there. Next up at number three, the Mary Celeste, which in fact may very well be the world's most infamous ghost ship as well as one of the longest enduring mysteries of the seven seas. Built in Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia in 1861 and launched under the new name of the Mary Celeste in 1868, this merchant brigantine sailed uneventfully across the Atlantic for years as a seaworthy efficient vessel. It wasn't until her fateful voyage in 1872 where the true ghostly legend began, which has since gathered theories that vary from submarine earthquakes, water spouts, an attack by a giant squid, and even paranormal intervention. No one will truly know the ultimate fate of the Mary Celeste with every single soul on board never being seen or heard from again, which is a terrifying thought in itself, isn't it? The Mary Celeste was discovered adrift and deserted just off the coast of the Azores Islands on December 5th, 1872. It was a Canadian vessel, the De Gratia, which found her in a disheveled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with one lifeboat missing. The last entry in the ship's log was was dated 10 days earlier which detailed the vessel's last known location before these mysterious infamous events unfolded. On board was the ship's captain Benjamin S. Briggs, his wife Sarah and their two year old daughter Sophia and eight seasoned crew members all veterans of the sea. It poses the question what dire threat did the Mary Celeste face that caused a highly experienced captain to abandon his ship. Nothing was stolen, all of the crew's possessions and cargo were exactly as they'd left them but in all likelihood we may never know. Swinging in at number two, the Flying Dutchman. Of course, this legendary vessel couldn't not make this list. The ghost ship that can tragically never make port, doomed to navigate the perilous ocean for eternity. In actual fact though, the Flying Dutchman has had such an impact on nautical culture that it's easy to overlook the treacherous tale of its origin. It is thought that the legend of the Flying Dutchman first originated from the 17th century golden age of the Dutch East India Trade Company, a mega corporation that had a stranglehold monopoly on the Dutch spice trade that ran throughout the 16 and 1700s, where tale was told of a Dutch man of war that was lost just off the Cape of Good Hope. Purportedly, every soul on board perished after being ravaged by violent tempest. The following few days, numerous other trading ships reported seeing a ghostly, ethereal vessel out in the foggy mist of the ocean, flying the exact same colours as the Dutch vessel. Since then, the Flying Dutchman has gathered notoriety as the worst omen you could ever hope for of a phantom ship that heralds the demise of an entire crew, with sightings continuing all the way into the 19th and 20th centuries. In fact, perhaps the most recognised sighting was by King George V himself during a three year voyage in 1881 just off the coast of Australia. He noted in his personal log that 13 people had seen the same glowing flying Dutchman in the early hours of the morning, and later in the day, the ordinary crewman who had spotted the vessel fell from the foremast and in his words, was smashed to atoms. It's a little bit worrying that one. Eh? And finally our number one spot the Orang Medan. And where do we even begin with the bizarre, perplexing legend of the Orang Medan, perhaps the most terrifyingly unexplainable instances of a ghostly shipwreck in history? But, well, the leading physical theory of the Orang Medan may be even more horrifying than it first appears. As the legend goes, at some time in June 1947, an American vessel by the name of the Silver Star picked up several distress calls from a nearby Dutch merchant ship, the Orang Medan. A radio operator aboard the troubled vessel sent a message in Morse code, in rush, confused dots and dashes, it read, We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. And then a few moments later, after even more confused dots and frantic dashes, two words came through very clearly. I 
die. Then silence. Nothing more was heard of them. But well, when the Silver Star eventually located and boarded the apparently undamaged and otherwise seaworthy Orang Medan, what they found absolutely horrified them. Every single person aboard was found dead, sprawled on their backs, frozen in fear with their mouths gaping open and their eyes staring straight ahead. There were no survivors, but even more terrifying, apparently no signs of injury or foul play. Just as the Silver Star crew was preparing to tow the ship to a nearby port, a fire broke out in the Orang Medan, which shortly exploded before finally sinking into the depths. Since this horrifying incident, theories have ranged from the vessel carrying a highly dangerous chemical nerve agent to an entanglement with the CIA after a result of a secret experiment to an unprovoked alien assault. But if you haven't already sensed the theme with this particular list, it seems that we may never know. Coming in at number five, we have Stranded Ship. In Zakynthos, Greece, on the beautiful beaches lays a haunting site of a stranded and rusting MV Panagiotis ship washed up on the shore in 1980 and continues to lay on the sand to this day. Many tourists come to view this phenomenon and due to the mysterious ship it's been nicknamed Shipwreck Beach. Little is known about the ship and is highly debated. One theory is that the ship was used for smuggling and abandoned when the crew were being pursued by the navy on their way to Piraeus from Albania. Another theory states that the ship was making its way from Turkey with the freight of contraband cigarettes headed for Italy. When encountering stormy weather, the ship went into a cove where the crew abandoned the ship in fear of getting caught. Soon after the ship was abandoned, rumours started swirling that the ship had many valuable items on it and authorities eventually convicted 29 people for looting cargo and valuable equipment from the wrecked ship. The location of the Panagiotis was prominently featured in the hit Korean drama Descendants of the Sun, leading to a surge of interest among Chinese and Korean tourists. This beach was briefly closed for tourists in 2018 due to the fear of landslides due to a large boulder falling onto the beach, but left the ship unharmed. The beach was later opened and that same year the beach was named as the world's best beach in a poll by over 1,000 travel journalists and professionals. The beach and surrounding areas are stunning, but the mysterious of the ship lingers and gives creepy vibes when you're on vacation in such a beautiful place. Some tourists have stated while getting close to the ship they've heard noises coming from inside and some locals believe that this ship is haunted by the past crew members. In at number 4 we have numerous lost cities. One of the most famous lost cities that have been located in the ocean is the lost city of Atlantis. The lost city used to actually consist of a few islands where the founders had created a utopian civilization and became a great naval power. Their home consisted of concentric islands separated by wide moats and linked by a canal. The island of gods contained gold, silver and other precious metal and had an abundance of rare and exotic wildlife. Many believe Atlantis and the story behind it was a fictional story that was created by an ancient Greek philosopher Plato, but others believe it was a real story and that the lost city is supposedly located in the Atlantic Ocean, while others say it is the Mediterranean or under Antarctica, and this is a popular debate. Besides the highly debated Atlantis, there are currently at least a dozen lost cities that rest at the bottom of the ocean near places like Greece, Japan and India. The sunken palace of Cleopatra is one of the most fabled underwater remnants of the ancient world. It had sunken more than 1400 years ago when an earthquake and tsunami hit Alexandria, Egypt. One of the most spectacular and intact lost cities is Shicheng, or otherwise known as the Lion City, which is located at the bottom of China's Quandeo Lake. Not from ancient times, but apparently it was purposefully flooded in 1959 to make room for a dam and an adjoining hydroelectric station. Now the lost city comes from Dwarka, India which is known as the Gateway to Heaven, which was an ancient city dating back as far back as 574 AD. The ancient Dwarka was sunken by the rising of the ocean levels and taken to the bottom of the sea at the Gulf of Cambay. Marine archaeological explorations have shed light on the structures and other artifacts these ancient people lived in. Many things have been seen and recovered like ancient structures, grids, pillars, stone anchors, pottery, stone sculptures, bronze, copper and so much more. Number 3 on this list is Megalodon. Would this list really be complete if I didn't include the ancient king of the sea? Eleanor Imster writes, Scientists think that Megalodon looked like a stockier version of the great white shark, with strong, thick teeth built for grabbing prey and breaking bones. Regarded as one of the largest and most powerful predators who have ever lived, fossil remains of Megalodon suggest that this giant shark reached a length of about 60 feet. 
their large jaws could exert a bite force up to 24,000 to 41,000 pounds. That is a massive, massive animal, guys. Multiple times bigger than the great white sharks we have today. This thing was so big that it would actually eat entire whales. Now, many myths have surrounded Megalodon and its existence since scientists first brought this mammoth of the sea up. Estimates say that Megalodon went extinct roughly 2.6 million years ago, but some people don't buy into that theory. For quite a while now, the legend of a giant shark still living amongst the ocean has had a lot of people wondering if it's possible. If Megalodon was still alive, is it possible that we still wouldn't know about it? How could we miss a creature this giant? How many of them would there be left in the waters? There are surely a lot of questions that come up if you believe Megalodon is still a reality. If this creature was still alive, then people think the Marianas Trench is where it's located, a place so deep and uncharted that it's hard for us to know for sure what's down there. I'm personally not convinced this creature still roams the ocean, but comment down below your thoughts. Is Megalodon still alive? What do you think? Number two on this list is the Kraken. The Kraken is one of the largest sea monsters that is said to exist. It all started in Nordic folklore many hundreds of years ago when sailors told tale of a massive beast that preys upon the waters of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland. This fearsome beast was said to pull entire ships to their doom and eat every human on board. The first account of the legend was in 1180 by the King of Norway at the time. Since then, sightings of the creature and lore surrounding its capabilities have grown through the years. Fiction writers and movie makers have also latched onto this creature and included it in many stories. As cool as it would be though, to our current knowledge, the Kraken itself isn't real. However, something similar to it definitely is. The Giant Squid. The Giant Squid is a massive squid that's said to be able to grow up to 13 meters in length. Sightings have even put this creature at 20 meters before, but those have never been proven. Even if 13 meters is the maximum length, that's still a large animal and something that would frighten anyone if you're seeing it for the first time. Many experts believe that the legend of the Kraken happened when Norwegian sailors stumbled upon this giant squid, and rather than name it a giant squid, they called it the Kraken. As time went on, the legend spiraled out of control until we got this massive sea monster which attacks boats. Now even though that might be a bit far from the truth, could I believe that there was one giant squid that was potentially bigger than the rest? Absolutely I could. I could also believe that this giant squid might have attacked a ship or two in its time and maybe even brought one down. If it did do all of that, then there really wouldn't be any difference between this squid and the Kraken. Either way, if you see a massive sea creature with tentacles coming after you, I'd just swim the opposite direction. Number one on this list is the Hook Island Sea Monster. It was first spotted by Robert Le Sarek in 1964 off of Hook Island and after he saw the monster, he went on to describe it in detail. He said, it was only when we got to within 20 feet of the serpent that we could see its head clearly. The head was large, about four feet from top to bottom with jaws about four feet wide. The lower jaw was flat like that of a sandfish. The skin was smooth but rather dull, brownish black in color. The eyes seemed pale green, almost white. The skin looked more like that of a shark than an eel. There were no apparent scales nor did we see any parasites around. We supposed the flexible tail would have shaken any off. There were no fins or spines, nor were there any apparent breathing openings, although there must have been some. Perhaps we didn't see them because our attention was focused mainly on the creature's menacing mouth, the inside of which was whitish. The teeth appeared to be small. A fragment of some dark substance hung from the upper row of teeth, possibly a fish. As the monster was lying on the sandy bottom, we could not see the color of its belly. The creature was about 90 feet long. Behind the head, the body was about 2 feet 4 inches thick and remained that way for about 25 feet. Then it gradually tapered into a whip-like tail. The general color of the body was black with one foot wide brownish rings every 5 feet the first starting just behind the head. The skin was smooth, but dull. So that's his description, and after he and his family saw it, he took some pictures of the creature to prove his claims. We have to remember that these pictures were taken in 1964, and doctoring them would have been far more difficult back then than it is today. I also tend to believe this claim more than most based on the level of detail he described the beast. Obviously it was a pretty jarring experience if he was able to describe the creature in that much detail. 
Since the claims, people have researched Hook Island for this monster, but with no luck. Hopefully one day we can spot this monster again and know for certain that it truly exists. Kicking off today's list, we have the sunken city of Dwarka. Until roughly 50 years ago, it was simply a legend, a story passed throughout the ages. The most famous legend about the lost city of Dwarka can be found in the ancient epic of Mahabharata. Dwarka, similar to Atlantis, is said to have sunk beneath the sea at some point in the distant past. According to the sacred scripture of Srimad Bhagavatam, the city of Dwarka was built in response to Jarasandha, the ruler of Magadha, who was constantly attacking Mathura. To prevent further attacks on his clan, Lord Krishna decided to establish a separate city on India's western coast. The city quickly rose to prominence and began the unstoppable pivot of Lord Krishna's mission, housing thousands of people in approximately 900 palaces that were crafted out of silver, gold, and precious stones, along with being heavily fortified and could only be reached by ship. At the time, the city of Dwarka quickly became a talking point around the world, inspiring awe and wonder. According to the Mahabharata's 23rd and 34th stanzas, the city was inundated and submerged by the Arabians sea on the day that Krishna departed the earth to join the spiritual world after 125 years, and this is when the Kali Age began. The ocean's deity reclaimed the land, sinking the lost city of Dwarka, but sparing Lord Krishna's palace. It is also said that the lost city of Dwarka was attacked by Vimana, a flying machine. The description of the fight encourages ancient alien theories, as it appears that it was fought with sophisticated technology and powerful weapons from orbit. The spacecraft launched an attack on the city using energy weaponry, which resembled a lightning strike to onlookers, and it was so devastating that much of the city lay in ruins following the attack. A marine scientist discovered remnants of an underwater civilization near the coast of Dwarka, the city that's still on land that is, in the 1970s. And in 2002, scientists discovered an extremely advanced civilization from the past lying untouched beneath the ocean's surface. With the help of sound matrix and image technology, along with sub-bottom profiling, marine scientists were able to find the exact location of the city, including some stone structures. The lost city of Dwarka was officially found 120 feet underwater in the Gulf of Cambay, Kambat off the western coast of India. Thanks to carbon testing, it was established that the city is anywhere between 7,000 to 9,500 years old, and stretches out 7 to 8 kilometers long and 3 to 4 kilometers in width. The most fascinating, or creepy thing about this underwater city, depending on your point of view, is that all human remains are still intact. Ergo, the main reason it made its way to today's list. Look, I'm not a scuba diver, but I can't think I'd be too fond of swimming around casually, admiring, you know, architecture, and BAM! perfectly preserved dead bodies. During the 2002 excavation of Dwarka, many mud vessels, temple bells, ancient ritualistic vessels, and you know, other artifacts were found, with the carbon dating indicating that they date back to roughly 7200 BC, otherwise known as the prehistoric period. At the time of this research, scientists also found that a massive man-made wall that's almost 2,000 feet tall that has since been unearthed during periods of low tide and can't be easily seen. Granted, they're still waiting on absolute results from some strange structures made of iron they weren't able to identify. Maybe they're from the aliens? In fourth place, we have the Antarctica sea spiders. Okay, I'll admit it now, this one might be on the list purely because of how much it made me jump while researching. Seriously, look at the photos of these things. Mm. Yeah, this reaction is genuine. If I get nightmares tonight, I'm blaming y'all, okay? Before I start talking specifically about the big guys, time to dive into exactly what sea spiders are. Sea spiders are marine arthropods of the Pantopoda order and belong to the Pycnogonida class. They're cosmopolitan, and well, to some of us that sounds like a fancy drink. It just means they're found in oceans around the world. Lucky for me. There's over 1,300 known species, and they have legs ranging from one millimeter to over 70 centimeters in length. And that's over two feet in length. Well, most of them are towards a smaller end of this range, that one qualify as terrifying now. Would it? Although sea spiders are not true spiders, or even arachnids, their traditional classification as chelicerates would place them closer to true spiders than to other well-known arthropod groups, such as insects or crustaceans if correct. Sea spiders tend to either walk along the bottom of the ocean with their stilt-like legs, or just swim above it using an umbrella pulsing motion. They're mostly carnivorous predators, or scavengers, that feed on sponges, polychytes, and bryozoans. Alright, time to talk specifically about the big guys. Those really long legs I mentioned a moment ago are everything to the Antarctic sea spider, since they're where its vital organs are kept, because it doesn't have much of a body. Its proboscis is also important, because that's what it uses to suck the insides out of worms, jellyfish, 
brush, sponges, and other soft body prey. Sounds delicious, I guess? Right now, all I can picture is like that one scene from The Lion King where Timon and Pumbaa are sucking the insides out of squishy bugs, and I'm pretty sure Simba and I are having the exact same facial reaction. For my brain's sake, it's highly unlikely for most of us to ever come across one of the giant spiders since they only live in the oceans around the polar regions. Gigantism has been observed in a number of other Arctic and Antarctic species, leading to biologists to consult a couple of theories that certain elements of the polar environment must be conducive to humongous body size. Over several hypotheses have been put forward, with some scientists claiming that large body size may have developed as an evolutionary trait to enable animals to withstand long periods of starvation during the winter, when resources tend to become, you know, scarce in the polar regions. While others have suggested that some of these species may be somehow descended from creatures that invaded the Arctic and Antarctic from the deep sea, where high rates of gigantism have also been recorded. However, a recent study lends support to an entirely different theory, which resolves around the availability of oxygen in the polar oceans, since oxygen is more soluble in cold water than warm water. It has been suggested that this high availability of oxygen, coupled with the fact that low temperatures slow animals' metabolism down and reduce their need for oxygen, could facilitate their gigantism. And hey, they're not venomous, so overall, they're not as dangerous. Uh, but that's not going to stop my fears. In a number three, a suspected UFO. In 2011, a group of Swedish divers discovered a mysterious object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The divers that were exploring the sea floor that came across the UFO-shaped object had their equipment stop working as they approached the object. Professional diver Steven Hogenburn, who is part of the Ocean X team, said that some of the team's cameras and satellite phones refused to work when directly above the object and would only work when they were at least 200 meters away from the so-called UFO. The Swedish diving team noted there was a 985 foot flattened out runway leading up to the object, implying that it skidded along the path before stopping. Member Dennis Asberg said, I am 100% convinced and confident that we have found something that is very, very, very unique. Many of the divers were convinced that their finding was in fact a UFO, but some added theories that maybe the object could have been a meteorite or an asteroid, a volcano or a U-boat from the Cold War, but no one was really sure. The divers had returned to the site the next year to get a better look at the anomaly and had in fact found a second object near the first finding. They had taken a sonar image of the new finding due to mysterious electrical interference. It wasn't much of a clear image, and the group had only released the original finding image because the second finding was so blurry. With only a single blurry image and little information, many speculate that the object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea could in fact be a UFO, a portal into another world, or even an underwater Stonehenge. The theories received more attention when artist Hulk Vact had created a 3D interpretation of the mysterious object, which looks eerily similar to a UFO or something not of this world. On December 10th, 2014, the website Earth We Are One actually published an article claiming a UFO shaped like a Millennium Falcon from Star Wars had been discovered at the bottom of the Baltic Sea and explained more about the dive and findings. We may never really know what this mysterious object truly is, and many believe it might be, but others believe it could be something else, but no one really knows. In at number two, we have Giant Eyeball. In 2012, a giant eyeball was found by a beachcomber in Pompano Beach in Florida, and this discovery is baffling wildlife officials. The softball-sized eyeball was reported to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and then sent to the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Petersburg to be put on ice, so further analysis could be done to try and figure out what sea creature this eyeball had come from. Marine biologists will use genetic testing to try and solve this mystery and try and find an answer. When the picture came out of this mysterious eyeball, the internet went crazy, and the mystery eyeball soon went viral, and some have suggested that the eye came from a monster fish, a giant squid, or even a Whale. Many people are leaning towards the eyeball is from a giant squid, but the spokeswoman for the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, Carly Seckelson, said they are leaning toward a different scenario. The primary suspect right now would be a large fish like a swordfish, a tuna of some sort of deep water fish species. Heather Bracken Grissom, an assistant professor in the marine science program at Florida International University in Miami, believed that this huge blue eyeball may have come from a deep sea squid or a large swordfish. The professor and her colleagues concluded that the eyeball's 
lens and pupil are similar in shape to that of a deep sea squid and noted that a deep sea squid's eyeball can be as large as a soccer ball and can easily become dislodged. After the marine biologist test came back they were still left with not many answers of what creature this eyeball came from but it was determined to have bone fragments around it debunking the theory of it being from a giant squid. Many different parts of different sea creatures have washed up or have been discovered by divers but soon determined by marine biologists to be a specific sea creature or species but this eyeball continues to be a mystery. This story just proves that we know very little about the ocean and who or what is swimming down there especially in the deepest depths of the sea. And finally in at number one we have Icicle of Death or better known as the icy finger of death. It creeps through the ocean's depth like a frozen eel, an eerie phenomenon known as brine icicles. Brine icicles are most commonly called the icicles of death. It freezes everything it touches. Only discovered in the 1960s, these things grow towards the sea floor from the base of the Arctic and Antarctica sea ice. This phenomenon happens when extremely cold brine sink to the bottom of the water, reaching warmer seawater below. The water around it flash freezes, creating a descending tube of ice known as a brinicle. Sometimes an underwater icicle reaches the sea floor and when it does a web of ice forms and spreads, entombing and freezing everything in its path including any unlucky sea life such as a starfish and sea urchins. Andrew Thurber, professor at Oregon State University and avid diver had actually seen a brinicle bloom first hand and stated, they look like an upside down cacti that are blown from glass, like something from Dr. Zeus's imagination. They're incredibly delicate and can break with only the slightest touch. The formation of a brinicle was first filmed in 2011 by producer Catherine Jeffs and cameraman Hugh Miller and Doug Anderson for the BBC series Frozen Planet. They can even create brine pools, which are called the Black Pool of Death, and are toxic to marine animals due to their high salinity and anoxic properties, which can lead to toxic shock and possibly death. Based on what scientists have learned so far, they believe life on Earth may have originated from these tentacles and that they may even harbor conditions suitable for life to form on other planets and moons. In at 5, Sirens. Hailing from Greek mythology, sirens were supposedly dangerous creatures who, according to the legend of Odysseus, the sirens would lure nearby sailors with their enchanting music and singing, which would cause them to shipwreck on the rocky coasts of the Sirens Island. The ships would be wrecked and the sailors aboard would perish either by drowning or slain by the sirens themselves. However, what makes these creatures interesting is that whatever they did to their captives is unknown, but has been implied throughout mythology that they ate the unfortunate sailors. Savage. Now when Odysseus sailed towards the island housing the sirens, he ordered his crew to tie him to the mast so that he could hear the siren songs without being led astray. Smart mans. The crew were also ordered to plug their ears with beeswax so that they could not hear. In turn, Odysseus' ship pass safely by the island. Now these mythological monsters were believed to combine women and birds in various ways, often represented as birds with large female heads, bird feathers and scaly feet. However, throughout history this depiction would change, with them now being represented as female figures with the legs of birds, with or without wings, playing a variety of musical instruments, particularly harps. They have also been depicted as beautiful women whose bodies, not just their voices, are seductive. Now according to Ovid, the sirens were the companions of a young Persephone. Demeter gave them wings to search for Persephone when she was abducted by Hades. However, Demeter would curse the sirens for failing to intervene in the abduction and were ultimately fated to live only until their mortals, who heard their songs, were able to pass them by. In at four, your Manganda. Hailing from Norse mythology, your Manganda, meaning huge monster and also known as the Midgard world serpent, is a sea monster and the middle child of the giantess Angboda and Loki. Now, according to mythology, Odin took Loki's three children by Angboda, the wolf Fenrir, Hel and Jormungandr and tossed the latter into the great ocean that encircles Midgard. The serpent then grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp its own tail. As a result of this it received the name the world serpent. When this monster releases its tail though, Ragnarok will begin. Frightening stuff. Once the beast releases its tail the seas will become violent as the serpent thrashes its way onto to land. Fenrir will set ablaze one half of the world with fireballs while Jormungandr sprays poison to fill the skies and seas 
beams of the other half. The two will then join the sons of Muspel into the plane of Vigrid. Here is where the last meeting between the serpent and Thor is predicted to occur. Thor will become occupied with battling Jormungandr and they will be unable to help others as they fight their own battles. Thor however will eventually kill the serpent but will fall dead after walking just 9 paces having been poisoned by the serpent's deadly venom. Tragic stuff, this dude is not to be messed with. In third place we have the Mariana Trench. I'm just going to apologize in advance because I know I'll slip up at some point if not every time and say Mariana's Trench out of habit. I can't help it. They're my favorite band. Even writing up my points today, I kept adding in the extra S. Feel free to let me know in the comments if you're also a fan. The Mariana Trench is an oceanic trench located in the western Pacific Ocean, about 200 kilometers east of the Mariana Islands, and it is the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. It's crescent shaped and measures about 2,550 kilometers in length and 69 kilometers in width. The maximum known depth is roughly over 36,000 feet, plus or minus another 80 feet, which is way too much math for my brain. At the southern end of a small slot shaped valley and its floor known as the Challenger Deep. For reference, if Mount Everest was located at this point in the trench, its peak would still be underwater by more than 2 kilometers. And just remember, that's the world's tallest mountain we're talking about here, not some cute little hike. The Mariana Trench has been a major area of intrigue throughout history, with the trench first being explored during the Challenger Expedition in 1875 using a weighted rope which recorded a depth of 26,850 feet. In 1877, a map was published titled the Tiefenkarte de Grosses Oceans, or Depth Map of the Great Ocean, for those of us who don't feel like butchering a pronunciation today. Most recently, in 2011, it was announced at the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting that a U.S. Navy hydrographic ship equipped with a multi-beam echo sounder had conducted a survey which mapped the entire trench to 330 feet resolution. As of 2022, 22 crew to descents and 7 uncrewed descents have been achieved. Some notable discoveries over the years include the 1960 expedition, which claimed to have observed large creatures living at the bottom, such as flatfish that were about 30 centimeters long, and shrimp. In July of 2011, a research expedition deployed untethered landers, or drop cams for those of us that prefer simple English, equipped with digital video cameras and lights to explore this deep sea region. Gigantic single-celled organisms with a size of more than 10 centimeters in diameter, belonging to the class of Monothelamia, were observed. Monothelamia are noteworthy for their size, their extreme abundance on the seafloor, and their role as hosts for a variety variety of organisms. In December of 2014, a new species of snailfish was discovered at a depth of approximately 26,722 feet, breaking the previous record for the deepest living fish seen on video. During that 2014 expedition, several new species were filmed, including amphipods known as supergiants, bringing us back to that deep water gigantism I talked about earlier. Now before any of y'all go, but Alexa, why is this scary? Well it's because it's a constant unknown. Being so large and so deep, something new and creepy is discovered every every time people explore its depths. Who knows what's still hiding down there? In second place we have the blue ringed octopus. Now just a little background, an octopus is a soft bodied, eight limbed mollusk of the octopoda order that consists of around 300 different species. Like other cephalopods, an octopus is bilaterally symmetric with two eyes and a beaked mouth at the center point of the eight limbs. The soft body can radically alter its shape, enabling octopuses to squeeze through small gaps. The siphon is used both for respiration and for locomotion by expelling a jet of water. Octopuses have a complex nervous system and excellent sight, and are among the most intelligent and behaviorally diverse of all invertebrates. Octopuses inhabit various regions of the ocean, including coral reefs, pelagic waters, and the seabed. Some live in the intertidal zone and others at abyssal depths. All octopuses are venomous, but only the blue ringed octopuses are known to be deadly to humans, ergo why they're my focus today. This specific species can be found in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia, and can be identified by their yellowish skin and characteristic blue and black rings that change color dramatically when threatened. They eat small crustaceans, including crabs, hermit crabs, shrimp, and other small sea animals. Despite their small size that ranges from 5 to 8 inches in circumference, they are very dangerous to humans if provoked when handled because their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin tetrodotoxin which can cause loss of all sensations and paralysis of voluntary muscles including the diaphragm and intercostal muscles ergo stopping breathing. The full list of possible side effects from the venom include nausea, heart failure, severe and total paralysis, 
blindness, and can lead to death within minutes. The blue ringed octopus carries enough venom to kill 26 adult humans within minutes. I'm just going to repeat that to be clear 26 adult humans within minutes. Their bites are tiny and often painless, with many victims not realizing they have been envenomated until respiratory depression and paralysis begins. Oh, and by the way, there is no such thing as blue ringed octopus antivenom available. And finally, in first place, we have the stonefish. Now, you might be asking, after the deadly octopus and a literal pit in the ocean, how can we get scarier? Welcome to where I almost jumped out of my chair and onto the floor. Stonefish are a family of fish called Cynocidae. They are famous for being the most venomous fish in the world, with a sting that causes excruciating pain in, you guessed it, humans. Their venom is lethal to other marine animals and humans, causing intense pain, breathing problems, damage to the heart, fits, and paralysis. Now, thankfully, unlike the blue ringed octopus, there is an antivenom, but if it's not delivered quickly, the effects can be. Fatal. We know of five different species that exist. The midget stonefish, or the Cynocea alula, Estuarine stonefish, or Cynocea orida, the Red Sea stonefish, or Cynocea nana, the Cynocea platyrincha, and simply the stonefish, or Cynocea verrucos. Look, I tried my best. They hail from the coastal regions of the Indo Pacific Ocean, so northern Australia, India, the Philippines, and others. Their name comes from their ability to blend in with rocky seafloors and amongst coral, which is what makes them easily stepped on by people and is a good chunk of the danger. They have 13 spines along their backs, which is what delivers the toxin, and at the base of each spine is a venom sac, which is activated under pressure. So, you know, when somebody accidentally steps on them. Now, if that's not terrifying enough for you, because we do have a reputation to uphold here, scientists at the University of Kansas have discovered that stonefish also have a hidden switchblade in their face that they can flick out whenever they feel like they're in danger. They call this bony, blade-like protrusion a lacrimal saber, and it's located on a bone under the fish's eyes. The saber is housed inside the fish's head, and they use their cheek muscles to deploy it. One good thing, at least, is that it's not venomous like their spines. Number five on this list is the whale fish. This fish is like a legendary Pokemon when it comes to how rare it is. Live Science says the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute released footage in August showing a bright orange female whalefish around 6,600 feet deep offshore of Monterey Bay, California. Very little is known about this bizarre fish because of the three drastically different appearances of the juveniles, which are called tape tails, males, which are called big nose fish, and females, which are called whale fish. The three forms look so different that scientists originally thought that they were three different species. This shape shifting transformation from juvenile to mature females is believed to be one of the most extreme among vertebrates. Whalefish have rarely been seen alive in the deep, so many mysteries remain regarding these remarkable fish. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute tweeted, Let's pull up this image from the Smithsonian that really shows off exactly how weird this fish is. So here we have the three fish, and you can see exactly how different they all are. The Smithsonian says there are other examples of males and females with very different shapes and of animals changing from one shape to another as they grow older. But this is one of the most amazing examples of sexual dimorphism combined with metamorphosis ever found among vertebrates. So we are talking literally about a super rare shape-shifting fish that in my opinion looks creepy as all holy hell. I'd say that you can find this beast at the bottom of the ocean but odds are you won't ever even run into it because of how rare it is. We've been exploring the bottom of our oceans for quite some time now and we are only just starting to learn a little bit about this fish. In all honesty, we really have no idea about it though. Whatever it is or whatever it does, one thing is pretty clear to me though. It's creepy looking, it lives at the bottom of the ocean, and I don't like it. Number four on this list is the goblin shark. This fish has got to be at the top of everyone's lists when it comes to the grossest looking creatures in the world. National Geographic says, swishing through the deep sea, a goblin shark notices a small, yummy looking squid. The animal inches towards its prey. But as the fish closes in, the snack starts to dart away. So the shark thrusts its jaw three inches out of its mouth. The jaw is connected to three inch long flaps of skin that can unfold from its snout. 
The predator then grabs the squid in its teeth. After scarfing down the meal, the shark fits its jaw back into its mouth and swims off. That's right guys, a goblin shark's top and bottom teeth are attached to ligaments or bands of skin tissue tucked into its mouth. When prey is just out of reach, the shark extends the elastic tissue out of the mouth to nab the grub. This allows the animal to chow down on snacks such as teleost fish and squid. It also makes the shark one jaw-dropping fish. These disgusting looking creatures like to live right at the bottom of the ocean and are native to the oceans around Japan. There are also some of them off of South Africa and in the ocean water surrounding Portugal. They can grow to be 12 feet long and weigh almost 500 pounds. These aren't monsters, but they may as well be. A 500 pound beast with a detachable jaw that looks like a goblin just chilling at the deepest darkest part of the ocean. I truly cannot think of a whole lot of creatures I would rather run into than this freaking thing. In at three, the Kraken. The Kraken is a legendary sea monster hailing from Norse mythology and is a creature of enormous proportions, meaning an unhealthy or twisted animal. The Kraken was borrowed for one of the main antagonist monsters in Ray Harryhausen's Clash of the Titans. This creature is often described as a cephalopod and resembling a giant octopus or squid. The Kraken is said to emerge from the depths of the ocean and envelop whole ships in the grasp of its tentacles and drag them beneath the murky waters. Now, most will remember this. This sea monster also making an appearance in the second installment of the Pirates of the Caribbean, which featured a more mythologically accurate depiction of the Kraken as opposed to the 2010 remake of Clash of the Titans. Now, its true mythological history goes something like this. After returning from Greenland, an old Norwegian author described in detail the physical characteristics and feeding behavior of the Kraken, proposing that there must be just two in all of existence, stemming from the observation that the beasts have always been sighted in the same parts of Greenland Sea and that each seemed incapable of reproduction, as there was seemingly no increase in their numbers. And while that fact may put some minds at ease, there is no denying the impact the Kraken has had on popular culture and sailors alike, with many fearing beneath those murky waters or elongated tentacles waiting patiently to feast. In at 2, Dagon. Dagon is a deity who presides over the Deep Ones, an amphibious humanoid race indigenous to Earth's oceans. Now, this bad boy was first introduced in Lovecraft's short story Dagon, but is also mentioned extensively through the mythos. Also referred to as Father Dagon, he is a great old one and the consort of Mother Hydra. Now Dagon is huge, really huge, and could potentially reach a height of 50 feet. He is an enormous monster and is worshipped by the devout cult of humans and deep ones, who revere him as their deity. It is rumoured that he is immortal, however his longevity may be attributed to his fraternization with the starspawn, who will oftentimes select specimens from a given species to protect Protect, nurture and empower for reasons only known to them. Now, Dagon is aptly described in the short story, I quote, With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast polyphemus like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. This is not a beast you would want to stumble across on a dark night. And finally in at number one, Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic entity created by our favourite writer over here at Top 5 Scary, H.P. Lovecraft himself, and was first introduced in the short story The Call of Cthulhu, which, if you haven't read it, get on it immediately. Cthulhu is a great old one of great power that lies in the depth like slumber beneath the Pacific Ocean in his sunken city of Rillier, and remains a dominant presence in the eldritch dealings on our world. Now it's near impossible to describe Cthulhu, however the most detailed descriptions come from the Call of Cthulhu and are based on statues of the creature. One of these statues constructed by an artist after a series of baleful dreams is said to have, I quote, yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon and a human character caricature, a pulpy tentacled head surmounted, a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings. Horrifying, right? Worse still, this oceanic monster has a loyal group of followers. It is unknown how large the throng of worshippers are, but his cult has many cells around the globe and are noted for chanting horrid phrases that translate to, I quote, in his house at Rillier, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. So what happens when Cthulhu emerges from his slumber beneath the ocean? Well, the story says that, I quote, the thing cannot be described, but it is called the green sticky spawns of the stars with flabby claws and an awful squid 
Edward Head with writhing feelers. All I can say folks is that if Cthulhu awakens there's trouble for not just you but for all of us. You have been warned. Kicking off at number 5 the SS Beichimo. Now although many tales of ghost ships and their legend are mired in murky mystery and spotty historical records, this one is perhaps one of the most well documented cases of a ghost ship in nautical history. Built in Sweden in the year 1914 the SS Beichimo was used as a trading vessel for routes between Hamburg and Sweden in and throughout the first world war. After the war though it was shipped over to Canada where it was employed by the Hudson's Bay Company carrying cargo throughout the Arctic region. There on October 1st 1931 during a routine voyage a devastating storm blew in and the Beichimo was trapped in pack ice just off the coast of Alaska. The crew quickly abandoned ship travelling over the ice to the nearest town of Barrow Alaska where they took shelter. Several days later after the storm had subsided the crew returned to retrieve their precious cargo only to find that the SS Beichimo had disappeared. Her captain decided that she must have broken up during the storm and sunk but a few days later Later, an Inuit seal hunter told the captain that he had spotted the Beishimo nearly 50 miles away from their initial position. As the story goes, the Beishimo didn't sink at all and for several decades after her abandonment she sailed the Arctic coast completely unmanned. In fact the SS Beishimo was seen on numerous occasions throughout the following century and several crews even managed to board her. In fact the last recorded sighting was by a group of Inuit in 1969, a staggering 38 years after she was abandoned. Her ultimate fate? No one knows. Knows, but it's safe to say that somewhere out there in the frozen north, the SS Beishimo is still sailing. Next up at number four. The Jenny. Now this one is a little bit murkier to say the least and historical accounts have varied from person to person. One thing always remains the same though, if the accounts are true then this nautical tale is perhaps one of the most bleakest and most despairing cases of a crew being lost at sea. As the story goes, the Jenny, an English schooner that set sail from its home port of the Isle of Wight in 1822 became frozen in an ice barrier just off the Drake Passage sometime in its voyage in 1823. Nearly a decade later Later in 1840, the start remains of the ship had been dislodged by the ice, only to be discovered by a nearby whaling ship. As some accounts tell, when the crew first saw the ship, they saw seven figures standing to attention on the main deck, and so thought that the vessel was mad. As they got closer, though, they discovered the grim truth: the seven figures standing to attention were, in fact, frozen in place, turned to ice by the Arctic cold. Things only got worse from there, though, and as the crew of the whaling ship explored the the vessel they found more and more bodies frozen in time deeper below the deck. As some reports go as the crew came to the captain's cabin they found him frozen in place with a pen in his hand. The final note written in his log read May 4th 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. Yeah spooky stuff. Number 3 on this list is the proboscis worm. I don't care what anyone says this has to be a monster. Just based on literally how freaking gross it is, it needs to be qualified as a monster. This species is also known as ribbon worms and there are actually a ton of ribbon worms in the world. The ones I'm talking about reside deep at the bottom of the ocean. These ones usually grow to be bigger than the other ones in the world. The Smithsonian Magazine says the largest species of ribbon worm is the bootlace worm which can be found writhing among rocks in the waters of the North Sea. Not only is it the largest Nemertian, but it may also be the longest animal on the planet. Uncertainty remains because these stretchy worms are difficult to accurately measure, but they have been found at lengths of over 30 meters and are believed to even grow as long as 60 meters longer than the blue whale. Despite their length, they are less than an inch around. Now these creatures don't have any natural predators and let me tell you why. Because they look disgusting. Like let me ask you guys, would you want to eat that? I would straight up need to be starving and there would literally need to be nothing edible left on the planet other than this thing before I decide to take a bite. It literally looks like a large intestine that just slithers across the bottom of the ocean. Shockingly enough, this is a real thing though and you can find it chilling in deep waters. Number 2 on this list is zombie worms. We aren't quite done with the worm talk yet guys because now we have got to look at zombie worms. Zombies are a pretty terrifying monster, so are these just like them? The Smithsonian says zombie worms don't crave brains, instead they seek bones. 
The one to three inch Ostax worms were first discovered in the bones of a rotting gray whale on the deep sea floor nearly 10,000 feet deep in 2002. Since then, more Osidex species have been discovered. There are 26 according to the World Register of Marine Species. Zombie worms don't eat mineral bones directly, instead they digest fats within the bone. However, their style of eating is quite different from ours because they don't have a mouth or a stomach. They secrete an acid from their skin that dissolves bone, freeing up the fat and protein trapped inside. Then, symbiotic bacteria living in the worm's body digests the fat and protein. How Osidax acquire nutrients from the bacteria isn't known. They may simply digest the bacteria or nutrients are somehow transferred to the worm. They hold on to whatever bones they can find by drilling in with roots which contain the symbiotic bacteria. Zombie worms can retract these plumes into the body when they are disturbed. If all this isn't strange enough, the only worms doing any drilling are female. The microscopic males live inside their bodies. One study counted 111 males inside just one female zombie worm. This eliminates the pesky step of having to search for a mate because the eggs and sperm are right next to each other. Then the worms can disperse many fertilized eggs far and wide, hoping that they land near some recently fallen bones. Needless to say, but these are some weird freaking creatures. No wonder we've nicknamed them zombie worms. They're about as monstrous as you could possibly get. Not to mention, but they feast on the bodies and bones of the dead, similarly to what zombies would want to be doing. Number one on this list is the Sloan's Viperfish. As with most things on this list, we have a thoroughly disgusting looking creature. This thing is just as dangerous as it is disgusting though. The Twilight Zone says, like many of the inhabitants of the deep sea, Sloan's viperfish sport light producing organs called photophores along its body. These flashing blue, green, or yellow lights might attract tasty snacks, but they're most useful for masking the fish's silhouette from predators below. They're also useful for grabbing a meal. When prey comes near, the viper fish drops a glowing light on its dorsal fin ray like a fishing lure in front of its mouth and snap. A muscular jaw filled with clear, sharp teeth comes crashing down like a guillotine. Lucky for the viper fish, its first vertebrae has evolved to act as a shock absorber for that powerful bite. This is the deep sea version of a piranha, except way more deadly. If you were getting attacked by piranhas, there would likely need to be multiple of them to attack you to actually win. I could totally see a world though where you lose one on one versus this thing though. Its teeth would literally dig so deep in your body. Even at the thickest part of your body, this thing has the potential to go all the way through if it bites you well enough. Thank goodness it's swimming thousands of meters below us and we don't need to worry about it popping up on our next snorkeling adventure. Number five, siphonophores. Now, what you're looking at right now definitely looks alien. It looks like something out of one of the Avatar movies. It looks like a giant sea serpent, right? What it actually is, is one long organism made up of countless individual creatures joined together called siphonophores. Now, siphonophores are some of the weirdest and most fascinating creatures in the ocean. They're a type of like colony. They're a living colony that consists of multiple individual creatures called zooids. Each one has their own specialized function and they all work together. From their appearance and behavior, there's not really a lot of things like siphonophores out there. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but they all share a basic structural design. They consist of a long, slender stem, or like a stalk, with multiple branches or tentacles coming out of it. Each of these branches or tentacles is actually an individual little zooid, specialized for a particular task like feeding, swimming, or reproduction. Oh, everybody's jealous of the reproductive zooids. <laughs> Always a feeder. One of the most Interesting aspects of them though is how they eat actually. They're active predators and they use those long tentacles to capture small fish and like plankton and stuff. However, unlike a lot of predators, siphonophores don't just use their tentacles to capture their prey. What they do is they use these stinging cells called nematocysts, which are located on the surface of their tentacles to paralyze their prey. And once their prey is immobilized, tentacles coil around and bring it to the siphonophore's mouth, which is located at the base of the tentacles. And yep, you are definitely gonna be thinking about that tonight when you try to go to sleep. Now, despite all these cool 
cool things I have told you, there's still so much we don't know about them because they're largely a mystery. They're difficult to study and understand, mostly because they're really far down deep in the ocean where we can't get at, and they're also extremely fragile. But boy! Are they weird? And if you're looking for more strange stories about horrors under the water, well, this is part two, so you already know we've got plenty of videos on that, and oh my god, if you like the Megalodon, we've got a video or two for you. But if you don't want stuff from the ocean, we got just about anything scary you could think of. Click on through and subscribe, and make sure you hit that bell and don't miss a scream. But, whew, slow down there, buddy. Do that at the end of this video, okay? I got way more weird sea creatures for you. Number four, the immortal jellyfish. We're all born to die. Are we not? That's what Lana Del Rey said, and I trust her more than anyone. Well, us humans, maybe. But some of us are built different, like the immortal jellyfish. The immortal jellyfish is a fascinating and downright eerie creature that's got the attention of scientists and the public alike. This thing is tiny, it's only about five millimeters inside, it's found all over the world, and it has an incredibly unique ability to regenerate its cells and reverse its aging process, effectively making it immortal. So far, this is the only creature that's been shown to prestige once it hits max level. It's a little joke for my Modern Warfare friends. This means that the immortal jellyfish can genuinely live forever as long as it doesn't fall prey to predators. Pretty good deal. While the idea of immortality sounds like a dream, I mean, that's like what half of like all science fiction stories are about, is trying to make yourself immortal, the immortal jellyfish has raised concerns about the impact of its population growth on ecosystems. Because these things technically have the potential to live forever, it's got the ability to reproduce rapidly and take over the habitats of other species, disrupting the balance of marine ecosystems. This could lead to an extinction of other species, and who knows what kind of ripples that would have on the food chain. And even though they're pretty small, I think an army of immortal jellyfish are actually kind of scary. Scientists are studying the creature's unique ability to regenerate its cells and hope that maybe they can unlock the secrets of human aging and potentially develop new treatments. This definitely has the possibility to benefit humanity in many ways. It sure would be awesome to live to like 300, but it also raises a ton of ethical questions and who knows what that kind of technology or research could look like in the wrong hands. If you've ever played the video game Bioshock, I feel like you should already know a thing or two about the dangers of harvesting undersea creatures for their DNA to inject into humans, it did not work well for anybody in Rapture. It was terrible there. So maybe it's best we leave those cells inside the jellyfish. Coming in at number three, the SS Valencia. Now this one's a little bit more interesting to say the least because it's a verified fact that the wreckage of the SS Valencia can still be seen to this day, scattered along the beach and rocky shoreline of Vancouver Island's West Coast Trail. After the ship struck a reef during a storm in 1906, the wreckage of the SS Valencia was considered to be the worst maritime disaster along the western North American coast, otherwise known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. The Valencia was a small ship, a passenger steamer that had a long history of carrying both passengers, cargo and troops, but at the time of her ruin she was operating as a tourboat, often running routes from San Francisco and up to Seattle. During the wreckage, tragically 136 souls were lost, with rescue efforts unable to access the Valencia in the ravaging storm. But our ghostly tale lies with those that tried to escape. You see, as the legend goes, in panic, the crew launched all of the Valencia's lifeboats, going against the captain's orders, all of which went horribly wrong. Three flipped on descent, dozens more capsized after reaching the water, and the last one disappeared out into the waves. Since the disaster of the SS Valencia, countless sailors and fishermen have reported sightings of these lifeboats listlessly floating upon the water during particularly calm days at sea. As some of the tales go, these lifeboats are still filled with the skeletal remains of the lost souls of the SS Valencia. Next up at number two, the Copenhagen. And it's quite the title really because the Copenhagen is considered by most to be one of the greatest maritime mysteries of the modern era, with only whispers, rumours and speculation as to its ultimate fate. Built for the Danish East Asiatic Trading Company in 1921, it was the world's largest sailing ship at the time, and primarily served as a sail training vessel for young cadets. In the eyes of many, it was the most impressive sailing ship ever built. However, as the story goes, on September 21st, 1928, the Copenhagen departed from northern Jutland for Buenos Aires on its 10th and ultimately final voyage. A total of 75 people were aboard and the journey was planned to span all the way to Melbourne, Australia and then back to Europe. But tragically, as we know, 
it was never seen again. The thing was though, the captain of the ship, Hans Andersen, was renowned for going long periods at sea without sending any messages. And so it wasn't until nearly six months later that the Danish company sent a search party. No wreckage or remains have ever been found. However, following the next several years of the Copenhagen's disappearance, there were a number of highly reputable sightings of a five-masted ship that fit perfectly its description. In July of 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter sighted what they refer to as a phantom ship during a gale. Their captain noted in his records that this may be the wrath of the Copenhagen. Dozens of stories and tales have perpetuated around the ultimate fate of the Copenhagen, but the truth is we may never know. In all likelihood though, it's still out there, somewhere, floating on the endless tide. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the seabird. And this story is the literal definition of a ghost ship and one of the most saltiest sea yarns that I've heard spun in a while. Although this one has a few more twists and turns that you may not have first seen coming. As the legend goes, in the year 1750, a vessel named the Seabird was idling off the coast of Newport Harbour in Rhode Island and had quickly attracted quite a crowd on the shore due to its elaborate craftsmanship. Soon enough though, the crowd of onlookers noticed that there was something strange about the Seabird. There was no one manning the ship, not a soul in sight. As the legend goes, several moments later, the ship, as if by a supernatural wind, perfectly sailed itself through the rough breakers of the beach, gently landing on the nearby Easterns Beach. There, a few brave souls boarded the vessel, only to find the seabird completely deserted, save for a boiling kettle on the stove, and strangely enough, breakfast already prepared at the table. Now, some accounts state that a group of fishermen had passed the seabird a few hours before and had even spoken to the captain themselves. Where had the crew gone? What had happened in the few hours that had passed since their last sighting? The truth of it is that no one may ever know, and such is the nature of ghostly tales from the sea. But, well, this is where things get a little stranger still, and take this final caveat with a pinch of sea salt. But as the legend goes, decades later, an old sailor reported to a New England journalist his deepest, darkest secret. In a fit of rage, he had murdered his entire crew just before making port, throwing their bodies into the ocean. And the name of that ship? Well, the Seabird, of course. Kicking off at number five, the Caliuche. And for this first foray into these particular ghost ships that haunt the sea, we're going to be heading over to the mythologies of Chile and the many legends that have been built around its coastal landscape. One of those, according to Chilean legend, is that of the Caliuche, a large ghost ship that sails the seas of Chiloe, a small island just off the coast, where it only ever appears at night. The ship itself is said to appear as beautiful, cast in a bright white light, an enormous vessel with three masts and five sails each. It is said that when the Caliuche appears, it is always at night and always full of lights with the sounds of a great party and a feast on board. Quickly though, it disappears, plunging back beneath the murky depths. Interestingly enough though, although this vessel is said to be similar to the Flying Dutchman, there is a boatload of mythology relating to this particular legend. One of these versions claims that the vessel is crewed by the drowned, souls lost at sea who are brought to the ship by three mythological figures in Chilean legend. Two sisters, one of them the Serena Chalotta, a type of mermaid, and the other, the Pincoya, a type of water spirit said to protect the Chilean coast. And then their brother, the Pincoy, their male counterpart who has the body of a sea lion. It's pretty cool. Once aboard, the perished souls can resume their existence in an eternal reverie of adventure on the high seas. However, there is a much more sinister version of this legend, which states that the crew of the Caliuche instead sailed the Chilo archipelago, luring fishermen and sailors toward it with an enchanting music to enslave them as part of their crew for eternity, where they are twisted and then contorted and put to work in their afterlife. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I prefer the first one, actually. Swinging in at number four, the Eliza Battle. And for this one, we're pinching the parameters of the Seven Seas, and instead, we're taking a look at one of the most notorious maritime disasters that instead of on an ocean, occurred on a river. The Tom Bigby River, to be precise, a stretch of water that runs between Columbus, Mississippi, and Mobile, Alabama. And here we have the legend of the phantom steamboat of the Tom Bigby. Back in 1852, one of the largest river steamboats constructed at the time, the Eliza Battle, was put into service between the two southern states. During one particularly cold February in the winter of 1858, after the Eliza Battle had departed the city of Columbus, the ship made its way down river, stopping on the way at Pickensville, Gainesville, Demopolis, 
boats and several other small river landings. By the time that the steamboat had left off at Demopolis though, it was filled to the rafters with passengers. And not only passengers, but also over 1200 bales of cotton to be ferried to the final stop. Now although it roughly still remains a complete mystery, around 2am on March the 1st 1858, about 30 miles downriver from Demopolis, the crew of the Eliza Battle awoke startled to discover that the cotton bales on the main deck were on fire. Flames soared and quickly engulfed the ship's hull, soon spreading out of control despite the frigid temperatures attributed to the odd gussy evening. The boat continued onward though the entirety of the exterior completely engulfed in flames and cut off from their lifeboats. The passengers, many of them who had awoken dressed in their night clothes, were forced to plunge into the icy river below. Now some of them survived mainly by floating atop the remaining cotton bales but all in all over 33 people lost their lives, both crew and passengers included. The Eliza Battle quickly sank beneath the water, the wreckage of which still lingers at the bottom of the Tom Bigby River. It's said that on a particularly cold and windy night, the Eliza Battle will emerge from the icy fog engulfed in flames once again, a warning sign of an oncoming ill omen. Coming up next on the list is going to be the Baltic Sea Anomaly. It's a very strange, unexplained object that was discovered in 2011 at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Now, this object is about 60 meters long and it's been described as a giant mushroom shaped stone or maybe a crashed UFO or some even think a sunken city. A UFO underwater, does that make it an unexplained swimming object? A USO? Of course, there are some who think that the Baltic Sea Anomaly could just be a natural formation formed from years of erosion, but that would be boring. Despite numerous attempts to study the anomaly and try and figure out just what it is, it remains a puzzle to scientists and a source of fascination. I mean, that's why we're still calling it the Baltic Sea Anomaly, not the Baltic Sea we know what it is. Definitely the most scary thing about it is that it's completely shrouded in uncertainty. This thing was discovered by accident, you know, they weren't even looking for it, they were looking for shipwrecks and happened to find it, and since then it has been the subject of constant speculation. Some, like I said before, believe that it could just be a natural formation, while others argue that this could be a shining piece of evidence towards an ancient civilization or even extraterrestrial life. There are some as well who are concerned that it could be a threat to the environment around it because there are some studies that have suggested that possibly the object could be leaking toxic chemicals or even god forbid radiation which would have some pretty scary implications for the Baltic Sea and the people who live near its shores. As well the fact that we know just like so little about this thing makes us wonder what could happen in the future. Could this be a Godzilla situation where this is a sleeping kaiju beneath the oceans that's going to come up and destroy a city? Probably not, but it could be. The Baltic Sea Anomaly, we may never find out a single thing about it. It's going to keep our imaginations going for years until we figure out just what it is. Who knows what dangers could be lurking. Could be nothing, but could be something. A reminder of how little we truly, truly know about what lies beneath the water. Number 2. Sakoyam What is the last thing you think you'd want to discover at the bottom of the ocean? Is it the Kraken? Cursed pirate treasure, a cavern full of misshapen skulls and bones. It's the last one. That's the only real one out of the three because that's our next point. This underwater cavern in particular, one Sakoyam, is located in the Yucatan. It's a sea note, and a sea note is a natural pit from the collapse of limestone bedrock that exposes groundwater underneath. And the Mayans sometimes used to use sea notes as places to perform like a little bit of human sacrifice, like just a little bit, like a teeny tiny little bit of human sacrifice. This sea note sits outside the ruins of the ancient Mayan city of Mayapan, south of the capital of Yucatan. It was a major political center from the 12th to 15th century and contained within its stone walls a secret Mayan city. Now there were around 40 sea notes which served as water sources for the residents and a pretty convenient place to store the misshapen bones of your human sacrifices. Legend says that this particular sea note is noteworthy for being guarded by a feathered horse-headed serpent. And when researchers dove in, they discovered there were very real reasons to be afraid. Bones scattered across the sea floors. 15 sets of bones marked by 15 bizarrely elongated skulls. These skulls were flattened during infancy. Um, 
Why the Mayans did this is a bit puzzling to researchers and, and me. Uh, I don't know how much you know about like anatomy and biology, but traditionally, this skull works best when it's not flattened. Now, interestingly, researchers believe that these people weren't sacrificed, but rather their bones were laid to rest here to get closer to the underworld as they await the next cycle of rebirth. I only hope we didn't disturb them. I don't want to wake someone up while they're sleeping. And number one, the Yonaguni Monument. Now, you've definitely heard of the lost city of Atlantis, this mythical city that could have been signs of an ancient technologically advanced civilization that people believe sunk. But have you ever heard of the Yonaguni Monument? It's been called the Japanese Atlantis. It's a mysterious structure found off the coast of Japan that's quite puzzled scientists and researchers for decades. Some argue that it was crafted by an ancient civilization. Now, the monument itself is a sprawling complex of stone structures, steps and platforms, and the most defining feature is this massive pyramid that looms over it with precise angles and straight lines that make it seem like somebody engineered this thing rather than this thing just happened. It defies natural explanation. Many people believe that this monument was created by some unknown ancient civilization that's been completely lost to history. The design and precision of the stone suggests that it was crafted, crafted with care and skill, likely by a culture with technology a little more advanced than ours. If it's a conspiracy you prefer that aliens did it, then definitely it's a possibility that aliens built this thing. Now, others believe that the monument is simply a natural formation, and I can already hear you booing that has been shaped by the forces of erosion and tectonic activity as if you really believe in erosion it's all a scam they argue that the angles and straight lines are simply coincidental and the monument is nothing more than a curious formation sure that's plausible, but it does feel like a bit of a cop-out, and I just don't buy it personally. I'm usually more of a skeptic than not, but I have trouble believing that erosion and the passage of time could create something so strongly looking like a lost city. It would just be a very big cosmic coincidence, is all I'm saying. Now we know so little about the monument, and perhaps we never will, and that's just what makes it so Interesting. So you let me know down below, what do you think the Yonaguni Monument is? Something from an ancient culture? Evidence of aliens on Earth long before us? Or just some rocks that happen to look like a temple? Number five on this list is a giant eel. This is a true story that comes in from a Reddit user, RCMW181. They write, an old World War II ammunition ship off the south coast of England was full of brass topped shells. Most had been taken by divers over the years and it was now very rare to see them apart from a pile in one corner of the ship. The pile of shiny brass metals was miraculously untouched and remarkably clean after spending years underwater and you only found out why if you swam near them. Out of the murky darkness, the largest eel I have ever seen snakes forward. Without exaggeration, this thing had a head the same size as a horse's head full of jagged teeth. I could not see the body as it looped into the dark and deeper into the ship. No one got near those shells. Turns out for years this thing had been guarding the shiny brass shells, slithering over them making them shine. We found out at a bar later that he was famous in the area and many people went to the wreck just to see him. No idea why this giant creature was guarding them like a dragon and its horde, but some said eels are like magpies and like shiny things. There are multiple scary discoveries in this story in my opinion. First off, our Reddit user just glosses over the fact that they're in a sunken World War II munitions ship. They don't say so, but I would have imagined that people would have died on that ship when it sunk, and there may have even been some remains of the dead still down there. Then to come face to face with a giant eel that is extremely protective over these brass shells would be terrifying. If that was a giant moray eel, then those creatures can grow up to two and a half meters in length and can be very deadly in the water. Had that creature interpreted what our diver was doing as threatening, and they may not have made it to shore later that day to be able to share the story. Number four on this list is a freezer. This story from a Reddit user is just all kinds of creepy. Count underscore Dynamo writes, I've done a number of dives, and the strangest thing I ever saw was a large deep freezer with a heavy industrial chain wrapped around multiple times with about five cinder blocks attached. It was very rusted, and the deep freezer itself had to have been 30 years old, probably more. This was about 90 feet just off of Vancouver Island, Canada. The situation gave myself and the other divers the heebie-jeebies. Logged the GPS and depth coordinates and notified the police. 
We were able to find out what was inside since one of the divers had friends with the local police. 10 porcelain dolls. Now for starters, I'm actually kind of happy that they found porcelain dolls inside that freezer because when I was initially reading that story and heard about a freezer that was locked up and weighed down, I initially thought of a dead body. But having 10 porcelain dolls raises a lot of questions. Were these dolls potentially cursed and that was the only way to get rid of them? If you've ever come in contact with a cursed doll, then locking it up is the first thing to do. Ed and Lorraine prove it with their handling of the Annabelle doll. If these dolls are cursed though, then this discovery gets even more scary. Clearly, whoever locked them in that freezer threw them to the bottom of the ocean and didn't want them to be found. Bringing them back up to the surface Probably wasn't the best idea. Next up at number three, the fire ship of Bay de Chaleur. Which, I mean, come on guys, that's probably the most awesome sounding title to anything on this historical list, right? The fire ship of Bay de Chaleur sounds like something that Geralt of Rivia himself would sail down to Skellig after a summer in Toussaint, but whatever, that's by the by, because this vessel in question actually takes us over to the eternally autumnal eastern tones of New Brunswick, Canada. Now, the fire ship of Bay de Chaleur is also more commonly referred to as the Chaleur Phantom or the Phantom Ship, and it often takes the form of a series of ghost lights just before a storm, appearing as a large three-mast galley. Now, the actual mechanics of this phenomenon are dubiously debated, and many believe it's caused to be down to either the weather phenomenon of St. Elmo's fire, or an undersea release of natural gas after a patch of rotting vegetation just off the New Brunswick coast. I mean, that's a completely different story entirely, but what we're concerned with is the actual origin of the fire ship, the history of which is equal parts tragic and gruesome. As the legend goes, back in 1501, a Portuguese captain had spent a year pillaging the coast of Bay de Chaleur, capturing Micmore natives for the slave trade. However, his cutthroat agenda was miscalculated, as a year later, when he returned to the region on his second voyage, he was captured, tortured, and killed by the Micmac people in revenge for their kidnapped tribesmen. The legend didn't end there, though, because a year later, the brother of the Portuguese captain sailed to the bay in search of his missing sibling and upon seeing the same flags, the Micmac people attacked the ship, setting it ablaze whilst it was moored in the bay. Cut off, burning, and with certain death facing them, the sailors swore to haunt the bay for a thousand years as their blazing fire ship sank into the Bay of Chaleur. Now, whilst later both Micmac and Portuguese casualties washed up on the shores of the island, the bay itself is said to be haunted by those that perished, often appearing as distraught sailors and warriors, their flesh burnt by the fire ship. Swinging in at number two, the Princess Augusta. And on the topic of ghostly phenomenon, this particular apparition is perhaps one of the most well-documented ghost ships of the 18th century, although the actual history behind it is shrouded in intrigue. Although the folklore account of this particular vessel is based upon the historical wreck of the Princess Augusta, a ship that sailed out of Rotterdam in August 1738 under the command of Captain George Long, in more modern records, it is commonly referred to as the Palatine, where the Palatine Light, the apparition in question, famously gets its name. And the reason for that is down to the nature of the ship. Alongside 14 of his crew, Captain Long's directive was to transport 240 German immigrants from the Palatinate region of the Rhineland to build a new life for themselves in Philadelphia. However, we know that this is the tale of a ghost ship, and from the offset, their vessel was afflicted with some terribly tragic luck. Not long after passing through the Atlantic, the Princess Augusta's water supply was contaminated, causing a fever and flux to spread through the ship, killing 200 of its passengers, half the crew, and the captain himself. The ship's first mate, Andrew Brooke, quickly took command as the survivors leapt out of the frying pan and into the fire, getting hit by severe storms that pushed the ship far off course to the north. They then endured three months of extreme weather and dwindling supplies, when eventually they emerged shipwrecked in Block Island, not far from Rhode Island. Here, the tale splits, but one thing is certain. Andrew Brooke, the first mate and commanding captain, took what remained of his crew and rowed ashore, without once looking back back at the cursed ship. It is said that some of the passengers survived, aided by the Block Islanders, but little to nothing is known about those that survived the entire voyage. As the legend goes, the Princess Augusta was set alight from the coast in the dead of night, pushed out to sea to burn and then disappear. At night, they say that if you listen closely, you can hear the screams of those that didn't make it back to shore. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the Duke 
of Danzig. And for our most terrifying ghost ship on this list, of course it has to be a brutal and bloodthirsty pirate ship, a privateer that plundered her way across the Caribbean, notoriously in the name of her royal namesake, the Duke of Danzig. This ship's seafaring career was relatively quiet for the first few years of service, mainly acting as more of a letter of mark, a deterrent more so than a private man of war. However, her fate quickly changed after changing command and sailing under the French captain Francois Aregnadeur. Now, his intentions were to sail and plunder his way across the seven seas, and plunder he did from Liverpool to Barbados, capturing and scuttling more ships than he could count on his way. However, despite being a vessel of the French Empire, strangely enough, sometime after late June 1812, the Duke of Danzig just disappeared. Although there are several records catching a glimpse of her around Canada but she was never seen again. After the last mention of her, it was thought that she'd been destroyed by a tropical cyclone or sunk in the night after an encounter with a British frigate. However, as the legend goes, that was not the last of the Duke of Danzig. After the golden age of piracy had been sated, a captain by the name of Napoleon Galois relayed his records of a French frigate encountering the wreck of the Duke of Danzig drifting listlessly at sea. As his crew witnessed, the ship itself was covered from helm to hull in dried blood, and in staggered rows were the putrefying corpses of her crew, many of which were brutally crucified to the masts or the deck. Strangely enough, there were no signs that she had been in in recent battle. In fact, despite the blood, she was pristine, no shot holes, and her sails and rigging intact. After searching the ship, Galois' crew found a stack of blood stained papers identifying the captain as the same Francois Aregnadeur. And then, as they left, the crew of the frigate set the brig ablaze, forever to be buried at sea along with her mystery. Coming in at number 5 we have the narwhal tusk. If any of you have ever seen the movie Elf then you are familiar with the cute narwhal in the beginning of the movie. And that movie really brought narwhals to the public's attention and making this sea creature more popular than ever before. But so much about this creature is a mystery. In 1577 the English explorer Martin Frobisher led an expedition of 150 men to the northern Canada in search of gold but they had come across something they had never intended and that was the sea unicorn. The myth of the unicorn Unicorn goes back centuries, and the business of unicorn horn trade was sustained through the Middle Ages and Renaissance by Vikings who killed the so called sea unicorns, cut off their horns, and sold them for an astronomical price. As European naturalists became more familiar with the world's animal, the myth of the unicorn faded. The mystery of the sea unicorn continued. Frobisher's discovery was actually what we know today as the narwhal, but the horn itself continues to be speculated by many. But the horn is apparently not a horn at all, but is a tooth. The relatives of narwhals include species like the beluga whales, orcas and dolphins, but the mystery remains of how did this massive freakish tooth evolve in this one specific species after its ancestors branched off from whales with ordinary teeth. Many scientists and researchers debate about what this tooth is used for and some suggest it's an acoustic probe, a rudder, an ice picker or a spear for battling predators. These creatures don't make it easy for researchers to see them use their tusk for anything at all, so it makes many people continue to question. It. Many have come up with many different theories about this so called horn and what they use it for and why they have it. It has created a huge debate between researchers and scientists to this day, but no definite answer has come out to this day. In at number four, we have the submarine disappearances in 1968. This is one giant mysterious situation which is the disappearance of four submarines from four different countries in 1968. The USS Scorpion, a Soviet submarine K 129, a French submarine Minerve, and the INS Dakar went inexplicably missing over just a five month period, and the last two disappearing only four days apart. The exact causes of these sinkings remain unknown and remain a mystery over 50 years later. The INS Dakar was scheduled to arrive in Israel on January 29th, 1968. When it didn't return, searchers went out to find it, but after a while there was no sign of the missing submarine. So the search ended on February 4th, and the 69 man crew was officially declared dead in 1981. The cause of the sinking was never determined, and theories say that either a mechanical or human error caused a catastrophic accident, or that the submarine snorkel was damaged after hitting another ship causing it to flood. The Minerve was on the training operation in the Mediterranean on January 27, 1968, and when they were on their way home the men were caught in a bad storm. When it was 30 miles away from the port the Minerve made contact with the men on land and said it would port in about an hour, but an hour came and went and the submarine had never returned. A frantic search was conducted with 20 vessels and aircrafts trying to locate the Minerve. 
Earth, but it was eventually called off on February 2nd when they found nothing. The K129 with a crew of 98 descended on March 8th, 1968, and almost two weeks into patrol on the North Pacific, the K129 failed to send a scheduled radio message. The Soviets soon began a frantic search, and after two months of no sign of the submarine, they gave up their search. The cause of the ship sinking remains unknown and will likely never be known. Almost three months after the K129, the USS Scorpion, a nuclear powered attack submarine with a crew of 99 men, went missing in the Atlantic while on its way back from a patrol in the Mediterranean. It was sent out on February 15, 1968, and toward the end of its patrol, it radioed that it was expected to return on May 27th. But as you can guess, the USS Scorpion would never return. Like the others, many searched for the lost ship, but on June 5th, the Scorpion and its crew were declared presumed lost. Over the years, there have been multiple searches for these submarines, but only parts have been recovered, and it's considered one of the biggest mysteries that happened in the sea. No one knows why so many went missing in such a short amount of time, how exactly they went missing for so long, and what exactly made these vessels disappear. And this is a mystery we may never get the answer to. Number three on this list is a color change. Now, a color change doesn't really sound that scary at all, but in this particular case, it's definitely pretty creepy. A diver writes, I was diving off the coast of Fiji and we went through a natural tunnel, like a 10 meter cave slash passage through a rock formation. So we start swimming through the cave and suddenly the light was weird, like the blue tint from the water has been replaced by a red one. Now all divers will know that this isn't only weird because the color changed, but also because red is the first color to disappear after a certain depth, usually between 30 to 40 feet, and we were well over 70 feet. Also bear in mind this was late morning on a sunny day. So imagine this scene, me and my dive buddy are going through an underwater cave and suddenly everything for no apparent reason is tinted red, a color that you are literally supposed to be unable to see while diving at that depth during the day. Upon exiting the cave everything was back to blue. I thought it was just me so I didn't signal to go back up. After the dive my buddy asked me if I'd seen the water tint red as well. We can't explain it and the folks from the local dive shop had no idea what we were talking about. Now that story is super weird. We've got to keep in mind that these guys were 70 feet below the surface at that point. If I was 70 feet below the surface and everything changed colors to a deep red, I would be very scared for my life. Obviously we don't know for sure, but it sounds like that cave that they stumbled upon is haunted by something. It's either haunted by something or that particular cave can produce some strange light phenomenon. Either way, it would have been very frightening and I'm glad that the two divers in this story made it out okay. Number two on this list is a school of sharks. The next discovery comes in from a professional diver in the Bahamas who was diving down to recover a dead body. What's crazy about this story is that the dead body isn't the scary part. His online name is Keith Bauer. Uh, and he writes, After an hour or two of searching, I went back into the blue hole to see if there were any signs of him. Saw the glint of his watch and his arms sticking out near the bottom. Started descending down to the bottom to recover the body. On the way down, realized that the bottom was a school of sharks that must have been there for breeding. So many sharks that they blocked the view of the actual bottom. Descended into darkness, grabbed his arm, couldn't stand to look at the body, and started ascending. The sharks followed and were circling around the both of us. Had to take a break at halfway at around 60 feet as to not get the bends. Extremely scared. The entire time waiting to normalize being super scared. Victim was struck by a passing boat. So not only is finding a dead body underwater super scary in my opinion, but to stumble upon so many sharks that you can't even see the bottom of the ocean. That's beyond terrifying. Then to have said sharks follow you up to the surface, deciding whether or not they're going to eat you would have been absolutely brutal. He didn't specify what type of sharks they were, but after doing some research, sharks tend to get far more aggressive during mating and therefore the risk of our divers getting attacked is significantly increased. Also, the number of sharks that can gather during mating season can rise into the hundreds. One shark is scary enough and will likely win in a fight, but tens to even hundreds of them would have easily had their way with this diver. Not sure about you guys, but if that was me, 
I would be exclusively a land dweller from then on out. Number one on this list is a person. People aren't typically scary discoveries, but in this case by some deep sea divers, it definitely was. One diver writes, me and two buddies were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was about 1am and we're a good 100 feet deep, the darkest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we'd get in a circle, turn off our lights, then stir up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in a black watery space. Only this time, we turn off our lights, stir up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. We were at a dive resort so it wasn't so odd to see another diver, only it was 1am and we'd see nobody else prepping a dive at the dock. He was also alone which was odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters and he had no fins or gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins or didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold but this dude was in a wetsuit with exposed skin. We thought we saw a giant gash on one of his legs. So the three of us all notice him and we're too scared to move. I can hear my buddies panting in their regs and the guy just smiles, waves, and then swims away. Whenever you think you're alone and someone just shows up like in an alley at night, it's weird. A hundred feet underwater at night is terrifying. After reading this story, I got some serious ghost vibes. Now obviously I can't know for sure and those divers didn't either, but this man just appeared out of nowhere and had a giant gash on his leg. He also wasn't wearing the proper gear and they didn't see him enter the water when they were getting ready to go. Potentially, rather than just be another diver out and about, this is the ghost of someone who went diving and died. Now their spirit just swims through the ocean for eternity. I've read a lot of ghost stories and reports of sightings before, and that has all the telltale signs of one. Coming in at number five, we have Stranded Ship. In Zakynthos, Greece, on the beautiful beaches lays a haunting site of a stranded and rusting MV Panagiotis ship washed up on the shore in 1980 and continues to lay on the sand to this day. Many tourists come to view this phenomenon and due to the mysterious ship it's been nicknamed Shipwreck Beach. Little is known about the ship and is highly debated. One theory is that the ship was used for smuggling and abandoned when the crew were being pursued by the navy on their way to Piraeus from Albania. Another theory states that the ship was making its way from Turkey with the freight of contraband cigarettes headed for Italy. When encountering stormy weather, the ship went into a cove where the crew abandoned the ship in fear of getting caught. Soon after the ship was abandoned, rumors started swirling that the ship had many valuable items on it and authorities eventually convicted 29 people for looting cargo and valuable equipment from the wrecked ship. The location of the Panagiotis was prominently featured in the hit Korean drama Descendants of the Sun, leading to a surge of interest among Chinese and Korean tourists. This beach was briefly closed for tourists in 2018 due to the fear of landslides due to a large boulder falling onto the beach, but left the ship unharmed. The beach was later opened and that same year the beach was named as the world's best beach in a poll by over 1,000 travel journalists and professionals. The beach and surrounding areas are stunning but the mysterious of the ship lingers and gives creepy vibes when you're on vacation in such a beautiful place. Some tourists have stated while getting close to the ship they've heard noises coming from inside and some locals believe that this ship is haunted by the past crew members. In at number 4 we have numerous lost cities. One of the most famous lost cities that have been located in the ocean is the lost city of Atlantis. The lost city used to actually consist of a few islands where the founders had created a utopian civilization and became a great naval power. Their home consisted of concentric islands separated by wide moats and linked by a canal. The island of gods contained gold, silver and other precious metal and had an abundance of rare and exotic wildlife. Many believe Atlantis and the story behind it was a fictional story that was created by an ancient Greek philosopher Plato, but others believe it was a real story and that the lost city is supposedly located in the Atlantic Ocean, while others say it is the Mediterranean or under Antarctica, and this is a popular debate. Besides the highly debated Atlantis, there are currently at least a dozen lost cities that rest at the bottom of the ocean near places like Greece, Japan and India. The sunken palace of Cleopatra is one of the most fabled underwater remnants of the ancient world. It had sunken more than 1400 years ago when an earthquake and tsunami hit Alexandria, Egypt. One of the most spectacular and intact lost cities is Shicheng, or otherwise known as the Lion City, which is located at the bottom of China's Quandeo Lake. Not from ancient times, but apparently it was purposefully flooded in 1959 to make room for a dam and an adjoining hydroelectric station. Another lost city comes from Dwarka, India. 
which is known as the Gateway to Heaven, which was an ancient city dating back as far back as 574 AD. The ancient Dwarka was sunken by the rising of the ocean levels and taken to the bottom of the sea at the Gulf of Cambay. Marine archaeological explorations have shed light on the structures and other artifacts these ancient people lived in. Many things have been seen and recovered like ancient structures, grids, pillars, stone anchors, pottery, stone sculptures, bronze, copper and so much more. Coming in at number 3 we have the Bermuda Triangle. Named for the triangular shape of around 500,000 square miles of ocean between Miami, Bermuda and Puerto Rico, for centuries the Bermuda Triangle has been mystified as a harrowing patch of ocean where sailors and pilots are prone to lose contact with the natural world and disappear forever. Back when Christopher Columbus first sailed the area, he claimed to see a giant ball of light in the sky that crashed into the horizon and made it glow. Soon after, all sorts of strange events happened in the area, including several boats mysteriously disappearing, and in one incident in 1945, an entire squadron of US torpedo bombers vanished into thin air due to all these weird instances, giving this place the name the Devil's Triangle. The exact number of ships and airplanes that have disappeared is not known, but it's estimated that around 50 ships and 20 planes have been victim to the Bermuda Triangle, and many of these mysterious disappearances of these ships and planes have never been recovered. Many see the Bermuda Triangle as a real phenomenon and have multiple theories to try and explain this mysterious place. And some of these theories are human error, paranormal explanations, violent weather like hurricanes, the Gulf Stream, which is a major surface current within the ocean, methane hydrates, which is a form of natural gas that causes bubbles to form around the ship and ultimately sink it without warning. All of these are only theories and the Bermuda Triangle to this day is the most notorious sea legend of all time. In at number 2 we have the Gulf of Mexico's cursed shipwreck. An estimated 4,000 shipwrecks litter the seabed across the stretch of water, and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the wealthiest locations for maritime archaeology in the world. In February 2001, oil workers for ExxonMobil were laying some pipeline when they happened to stumble upon a shipwreck about 2,600 feet deep. After discovering the wreckage, a team was assembled to explore this mysterious ship, but nothing seemed to go right. The exploration submarine malfunctioned right as it was getting ready to go down to check out the wreck, and that was only the beginning of these mysterious mysterious malfunctions. Others include video monitors going out whenever they fired their thrusters, sonars breaking and hydraulics going haywire with no explanation for any of these problems. After nothing working and things continuing to break, the Navy sent a researcher submarine down to investigate the wreckage, and on the way down it suddenly self-destructed, and somehow when it finally did get to the wreck, its arms were too short to reach anything. Six months later in July in 2002, a team working aboard the NR1 decided to launch a robotic sub down to the wreck site, but the malfunctions continued. The second the rover entered the water, it veered to the right and went out of control. The tether had caught in the propellers, which caused the vessel to smash into the underside of the ship and the rover was never recovered. Later in the summer of 2002, the curse would continue as a ship from Sustainable Sea Program of the NOAA offered to pick up artifacts from the site. The first time the vessel attempted to leave the dock, debris was lodged in the propeller. The second time the propeller locked and the ship ended up in dry lock, needing repairs. Over the years, many others have tried to learn more about this wreck, but little was found, and what was found wasn't at all helpful. To this day, nothing has been able to get too close to the shipwreck to investigate and explore the phenomenon and very little is known about this mysterious ship. Many believe the lives lost in the wreck continue to haunt the ship and will keep anyone and everything out of it at all costs. And finally, in at number one, we have the unmapped ocean floor. This is truly one of the biggest mysteries, and humans' curiosity about the Earth's floor is centuries old. Much remains to be learned about the ocean, especially exploring the mystery of the deep sea. From mapping and describing the physical, biological, geological, chemical, and archaeological aspects of the ocean, and understanding their dynamics. For centuries, scholars believed the deep sea to be a lifeless place. Until the late 19th century, we've discovered there is a diversity of life and creatures living down there. Many researchers and divers had tried to dive and take submarines down to explore more of this unknown place, but it's very hard due to the extremely cold temperatures, the darkness, and the literally bone shattering pressure that's more than 1,000 times that at sea level. In 2019, a retired naval officer, Victor Vescovo, set a new record as one of the deepest dives to date, reaching almost 36,000 feet down in a submarine into the deepest place on Earth, the Marianas Trench. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet's surface, driving 
weather, regulating temperature, and ultimately supporting all life's organisms. Throughout history, the ocean has been a vital source of sustenance, transport, commerce, growth, and inspiration. But to this day, more than 80% of the ocean remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored, and it's still unknown how deep the ocean really is. Given the high degree of difficulty and cost in exploring our ocean using underwater vehicles, researchers have relied heavily on technologies such as sonar to generate maps of the seafloor. But currently, less than 10% of the global ocean is mapped using modern sonar technology, and only about 35% of the United States have been mapped using modern methods. As we go deeper into the ocean floor, it's too deep for this modern technology because it's too remote and dark for this type of visual mapping. So if you go swimming in the ocean, it's very unknown of what is swimming and living below you. But scientists and researchers continue to develop technologies to unlock the many secrets of the ocean. The NOAA is working to increase our understanding of the ocean realm. Number five on this list is a mistake. So I know that's kind of weird. How do you discover a mistake? Well, in a story from One Dumb Diver, and yeah, that is their actual handle, they do just that. They write, When I was 15, I took the family boat out and dove the reef myself to clear my head. That was mistake number one. I was down at a depth of about 90 feet when I was only rated for 60. While diving, I spotted a 3.5 meter mako shark coming right at me. For those who are unaware, makos are basically the cheetahs of the ocean and they only have two speeds. Curious, which is harmless, and lunch. This guy was in lunch mode, so I hovered, as I'd been trained to do since there was no way for me to escape it. Nowadays, we dive with sharp shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away, but back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve, the idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and move along. So I wait, and it comes, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, it occurred to me, that I'd left my sleeve on my bed. I had my knife drawn, however now I had a series of problems. I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water and trailed blood everywhere. Once the shock wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt water and open wounds, they don't feel too good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which means I had to swim up to it. So I end up racing back to shore with nothing more than a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding. Long story short, my series of unfortunate self-inflicted events earned me 172 stitches, boatloads of physical therapy because the shark had actually bitten down into my tricep and detached it, and easily identifiable scars on one of my arms for the rest of my life. So that story right there, folks, is why I personally don't think I'm ever going deep sea diving. I love sharks, they're super cool, I love to learn about sharks, but I am more than happy to keep them in a tank at the aquarium and learn about them in that way. Swimming with them or discovering one in front of you on the day that you also forgot your protective gear, not something that sounds like a great time. Number four on this list is a barracuda. El Herrera 9519 writes, one time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower down than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her. It was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, staring intently at the shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and then slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore but still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little bit more aware of her surroundings when diving. So I looked it up and barracudas can grow to be 1.8 meters in length. Pair that with their extremely sharp teeth and the fact that shiny objects remind them of the little silver fish that they eat and you have yourself in a pretty bad situation. The woman in this story is honestly extremely lucky that this fish waited to decide if it was going to attack or not. Most times she wouldn't have had time to respond and it would have just gone to take a bite. Considering this necklace would have been around her neck, having a barracuda bite into it could have ended very badly. 
in a number 3 a suspected UFO. In 2011 a group of Swedish divers discovered a mysterious object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The divers that were exploring the sea floor that came across the UFO shaped object had their equipment stop working as they approached the object. Professional diver Steven Hogenburn who is part of the Ocean X team said that some of the team's cameras and satellite phones refused to work when directly above the object and would only work when they were at least 200 meters away from the so-called UFO. The Swedish diving team noted there was a 985 foot flattened out runway leading up to the object, implying that it skidded along the path before stopping. Member Dennis Asberg said, I am 100% convinced and confident that we have found something that is very, very, very unique. Many of the divers were convinced that their finding was in fact a UFO, but some added theories that maybe the object could have been a meteorite or an asteroid, a volcano or a U-boat from the Cold War, but no one was really sure. The divers had returned to the site the next year to get a better look at the anomaly and had in fact found a second object near the first finding. They had taken a sonar image of the new finding due to mysterious electrical interference. It wasn't much of a clear image and the group had only released the original finding image because the second finding was so blurry. With only a single blurry image and little information, many speculate that the object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea could in fact be a UFO, a portal into another world or even an underwater Stonehenge. The theories received more attention when artist Hawk Vacht had created a 3D interpretation of the mysterious object, which looks eerily similar to a UFO or something not of this world. On December 10, 2014, the website Earth We Are One actually published an article claiming a UFO shaped like a Millennium Falcon from Star Wars had been discovered at the bottom of the Baltic Sea and explained more about the dive and findings. We may never really know what this mysterious object truly is, and many believe it might be, but others believe it could be something else, but no one really knows. In at number two, we have Giant Eyeball. In 2012, a giant eyeball was found by a beachcomber in Pompano Beach in Florida, and this discovery is baffling wildlife officials. The softball sized eyeball was reported to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and then sent to the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Petersburg to be put on ice so further analysis could be done to try and figure out what sea creature this eyeball had come from. Marine biologists will use genetic testing to try and solve this mystery and try and find an answer. When the picture came out of this mysterious eyeball, the internet went crazy and the mystery eyeball soon went viral. And some have suggested that the eye came from a monster fish, a giant squid, or even a whale. Many people are leaning towards the eyeball is from a giant squid, but the spokeswoman for the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, Carly Seckelson, said they are leaning toward a different scenario. The primary suspect right now would be a large fish like a swordfish, a tuna or some sort of deep water fish species. Heather Bracken Grissom, an assistant professor in the marine science program at Florida International University in Miami, believed that this huge blue eyeball may have come from a deep sea squid or a large swordfish. The professor and her colleagues concluded that the eyeball's length and pupil are similar in shape to that of a deep sea squid and noted that a deep sea squid's eyeball can be as large as a soccer ball and can easily become dislodged. After the marine biologist's test came back they were still left with not many answers of what creature this eyeball came from but it was determined to have bone fragments around it debunking the theory of it being from a giant squid. Many different parts of different sea creatures have washed up or have been discovered by divers but soon determined by marine biologists to be a specific sea creature or species but this eyeball continues to be a mystery. This story just proves that we know very little about the ocean and who or what is swimming down there, especially in the deepest depths of the sea. And finally in at number one we have Icicle of Death or better known as the icy finger of death. It creeps through the ocean's depth like a frozen eel, an eerie phenomenon known as brine icicles. Brine icicles are most commonly called the icicles of death. It freezes everything it touches. Only discovered in the 1960s, these things grow towards the sea floor from the base of the Arctic and Antarctica sea ice. This phenomenon happens when extremely cold brine sink to the bottom of the water, reaching warmer seawater below. The water around it flash freezes, creating a descending tube of ice known as a brinicle. Sometimes an underwater icicle reaches the sea floor and when it does, a web of ice forms and spreads, entombing and freezing everything in its path, including any unlucky sea life such as the starfish and sea urchins. Andrew Thurber, professor at Oregon State University and avid diver, had actually seen a brinicle bloom first hand and stated, 
They look like an upside down cacti that are blown from glass, like something from Dr. Zeus's imagination. They're incredibly delicate and can break with only the slightest touch. The formation of a brinicle was first filmed in 2011 by producer Catherine Jeffs and cameraman Hugh Miller and Doug Anderson for the BBC series Frozen Planet. They can even create brine pools, which are called the Black Pool of Death, and are toxic to marine animals due to their high salinity and anoxic properties, which can lead to toxic shock and possibly death. Based on what scientists have learned so far, they believe life on Earth may have originated from these tentacles and that they may even harbour conditions suitable for life to form on other planets and moons. In at number 5, Underwater River. Within the ocean, there was a river found, and it's known as the Black Sea Undersea River. This discovery was the first of its kind in the entire world at the time and was found in August of 2010. The Underwater River is saline water flowing through the Bosporus Strait and along the seabed of the Black Sea. Before this discovery, scientists had previously found channels running along the ocean floor based on sonar screening. One of the largest is from the mouth of the Amazon River into the Atlantic Ocean and found off the coast of Greenland, the Congo and Bengal. It was believed that these channels could possibly function as rivers. It was this discovery specifically that truly proved their theory correct. This river functions due to the salty ocean water spilling through the Bosporus Strait from the Mediterranean Sea into the Black Sea, where the water has a lower salt content. The largest of these rivers are several miles wide and run for thousands of miles out into the deep ocean, and they proved to be vital to the creatures living in and around them. In many ways, these these underwater rivers are very similar to rivers we see on land. They have banks on either side and smaller rivers feed into the larger ones. These rivers carve valleys into the sea floor and they follow certain paths and can even change course. Due to the power and unpredictability of these rivers, they have been extremely difficult to explore and learn more about. Researchers tend to send down recording instruments and robotic submarines to try and learn more about these rivers. Sedimentologist Dan Parsons says that these rivers are incredibly powerful and have destructive flows, so it's important we understand how they work. If it was a river on the surface of the Earth, then it was ranked as the sixth largest river in the world. This discovery is truly an amazing natural wonder, and because they are so hard to research, study, and learn about is an incredible phenomenon. In at number 4 we have Great Blue Hole. The Great Blue Hole is located in Belize and is truly a wonder. The hole is a natural sinkhole with surrounding corals and shallow water accounting for the perfect circle shape and deep blue colour. It lies near the centre of Lighthouse Reef and it was formed during several occurrences of quaternary glaciation when the sea levels were much lower. Fun fact about the Lighthouse Reef can actually be seen from space, and the Great Blue Hole is near the centre of it and can see it so clearly from so far away. This site was made famous by Jacques Cousteau, who declared it one of the top five scuba diving sites in the world. It was first discovered in 1971 and then explored much more during an expedition in 1997 to collect core sample from the Blue Hole's floor and document the cave system. In December 2018, two submarines descended into the Blue Hole to be able to map its interior, and using solar scanning, they were able to make a 3D map of the 1,000 foot wide hole. They had discovered that there was a layer of hydrogen sulfide around 300 feet down. The Great Blue Hole has its name for a reason. It is extremely deep, and it has measured over 400 feet deep. At that depth, it becomes very dark, cold, and not much can survive down there. The submarine expedition also discovered bodies of two divers at the bottom. They were believed to be two out of three divers who had gone missing while diving there. This massive hole is a very popular spot for scuba divers for its crystal blue colour and being able to see many different species in and around the area. There are many different types of fish including the midnight parrotfish and the Caribbean reef shark along with different shark species like the bull shark and hammerheads. In 2012, the Discovery Channel ranked the Great Blue Hole as number one on its list of the top 10 most amazing places on Earth. And if you're interested in checking out this natural wonder, there are full day trips from the coastal tourist communities in Belize, and you can explore the Great Blue Hole. Number three on this list is a kelp forest. Duct Tape Jedi writes, After a day of boat diving in Monterey Bay on the California coast, we had a night dive planned. I was there with two friends celebrating my birthday and we were part of a larger group of divers. My friends were too tired for the night dive and I was too, but I got invited to buddy with another diver whose friends also decided to stay on the boat. So I was following my new buddy through the kelp when some of it caught on my tank. 
I tried to pull clear but managed to get tangled even more to the point where I was unable to move. I kept shining my light around looking for my buddy but he was nowhere to be seen. After what seemed like an hour but was possibly just a few minutes, I felt some of the kelp loosen up and then saw that my buddy was cutting it off with a knife. I was so exhausted after struggling that when we got to the surface, he had to tow me back to the boat. So discovering a full on kelp forest, I mean that would honestly be really cool I think. Obviously what happened to our diver would have been incredibly scary though. Having to wrestle for over an hour or however long he was there for with some kelp in the dark, probably thinking that you're going to drown, doesn't sound great. But if you did discover a kelp forest and that didn't happen, then I think it'd be pretty sweet. If you're going to go though, then make sure you carry your own knife because you wouldn't want to end up like our friend here. Number two on this list is a body. This story is from Texas Guy 911 and he says, I was diving in a local pond with a group of much more advanced cave divers than I was. I'm leading the dive as to get used to the pressures and responsibilities of heading the procession and they're mentoring me. The known horrible visibility makes it impossible to navigate by compass, so we follow a line put by other divers. These lines go from one sunken item to another. So I know I'm about to hit a small sunken boat, but I don't remember which one. There are a few similar in a row in the same state of decay. I'm the first in the group, and I get to the boat, and I see someone's black army boots sticking out from the inner quarters. It looks somewhat new, not like items you find on the bottom. It's hard to see due to so much muck in the water. So I touch the boot, thinking it's by itself, but it won't lift. Like it's attached to something heavy. I put my hand further in and feel the leg continuing out, pants, the calf, and now I see the second leg. I turn around and show a sign for the emergency ascend to the group behind me. Everyone has a sour face, nobody wants to go to the surface, but it's a rule that if one says up, others in the group must abort, no questions. They wanted me to explain with signs why, but what's a diver's sign for a corpse? I feel like I rush toward the surface, even though I'm trying to stay calm and take time. So we're on the lake's surface, I have this adrenaline rush, can't breathe enough. So I tell them there's a body down there. I see rolling eyes from everyone once they see I'm serious. I describe in detail what I saw and then we go down again. Once we locate it, we don't know if we should go forward or backward as there are several boats on the line and who knows in which boat the body is in and how far we drifted while taking it out on the surface. Well, we find all the boats before seeing the original one, of course. So our customary leader goes into the boat's cabin and we wait. I'd say he was rather courageous at this point. Then he emerges from the cloud of muck and tells us all to surface. So gluing information together from what we learned later on, it actually turns out the police or some other agency had body recovery training in the same lake the same day. When they went for lunch, they stuffed their fully dressed anatomically correct rubber doll in one of the sunken boats for a few hours for safe keeping. So that didn't turn out to be an actual body, but I still think this would have been super scary. To feel a leg and then another leg in the darkness of the water like that on one of your first dives, uh, I mean that would be a lot. Maybe I'm just weak because deep sea diving is just not for me, but honestly that would have scarred me for potentially life, whether the body is real or not. Number one on this list is a survivor. Off the coast of Nigeria roughly eight years ago, a tugboat broke down and sank to the bottom of the ocean. Three whole days later, a diving crew went out to the wreckage to see what was down there and recover the dead bodies. It was thought that no one could have possibly survived the crash and that all 12 people on the boat were dead. That's why the crew was so shocked when they found someone had actually survived. Maybe this doesn't seem as scary as finding someone who had died, but we're lucky enough to have the actual clip of them recovering this person and just watch as the hand comes out. All right, you found one, yeah? He's alive, he's alive. He's alive. The startled dive team discovered the tugboat's cook had survived for three days. So that one image of having a hand reach out of the dark and stormy nothing would have actually terrified me. Not to mention that man who survived down there. That would have been three days by himself surviving in this tiny air pocket, most likely believing that the world has left you for dead. This is definitely one of those scary discoveries that's for the better, because someone's life was saved, but as the Reddit user Edgar writes, I can't imagine how creepy and unexpected it would be to be on a mission to recover the dead and have a hand reach out to you like it did. Starting us off at number five, we have Yellow Jack. We're gonna set sail on a weird one to start us off. If you're a flag enthusiast, you might see the ending of this one coming from a mile away, but 
We'll get there in a minute. So the legend of Yellow Jack starts upon a spice and gold filled ship preparing to leave the Indies and head back home. The crew was accounted for, the cargo was secure, the captain was feeling Mwah, nice. Then, at the last second, a mysterious figure asked if they had room for one more. Feeling pretty good about their haul, they welcomed this extra pair of helping hands on board. Wrong move. Turns out this was a disreputable lad known as Yellow Jack, with a reputation so abhorrent that the ship was forbidden to enter any port she called upon. For ages, the crew sailed from port to port, hoping that someone would let them dock, but it never happened. They were forced to endlessly cruise the seas, running lower and lower on supplies. Patience, too. Eventually, the crew went mad and committed mutiny before they all murdered each other. Some say the ship is still sailing. The ghosts of these sea locked sailors manning the helm. Someday they may find a port that will take them and they will finally be able to rest. In the meantime, they will sail the seas, infecting other ships with the same madness that Yellow Jack caused. Now, this is a spooky, ghostly story in its own right, but it could also be a reference to a different ship killer at the time. Disease. The Yellow Jack is a flag flown by ships infected with plague, cholera, and other nasty, fast spreading diseases. So, Yellow Jack itself could be a metaphor for disease, and ports weren't letting them in because of quarantine procedures. Absolutely fascinating, and it would also make a killer movie a pirate quarantine body horror. Think The Thing meets Wreck meets Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh damn. Coming in at number 4, we have the Caliucci, a Chilean ship sailing around an island known for its terrible storms. Shining white sides, three masts with five sails, blood red. The ship sails independent of any human input. Sure, there's a ghost crew, but the Caliucci is known for being sentient. The ship has a mind of its own, it'll glide along the water at incredible speeds, and is able to submerge and continue navigating underwater, similar to the famous Flying Dutchman. When it passes, folks say you can hear the crew cackling for a brief moment. It's a ship known for the merriment of its ghostly crew. They throw parties often and hop around on one leg. The folks on board often only have one leg, because the other is folded behind their back, similar to another Chilean mythological entity. Top off their strange looks and mannerisms, some crew members have backwards faces, terrifying all who lay eyes upon them. Some say the Caliucci is manned by sailors both dead and alive, dragged from the depths and snagged off passing ships. Another legend says that the ship is piloted by the souls of the drowned, brought aboard by water spirits and granted the gift of life in exchange for their servitude. Not so sure that's a good deal, you know, life eternal but you'll always be on a stinky ship. Maybe the parties are just that sick. Merchants who trade with Caliucci supposedly become very wealthy afterwards, and anyone who has laid eyes upon it wears a crooked smile forever. Again, interesting deal. Lots of money, crooked smile. I guess you could afford a dentist and some plastic surgery at that point. In at number three, we have vampire squids. Not only are vampires on land, but they also have been found in the ocean. The vampire squids reside throughout the oceans all around the world, mainly in tropical oceans in extreme deep sea conditions. The squid uses its organs and its unique oxygen metabolism to be able to thrive in the parts of the ocean with the lowest concentrations of oxygen, which is extremely hard to do for many other sea creatures. The vampire squid is the only known cephalopod able to live its entire life in what's known as the oxygen minimum zone, at saturations as low as 3%. These squids were discovered during the Valdivia expedition in 1898, which was led by Carl Chun, a zoologist who was inspired by the Challenger expedition, and wanted to verify that life does indeed exist below 300 feet. Back then, much of the sea wasn't known about, let alone explored, so this was very new for that time, and during the expedition, the vampire squid was found. When the discovery was made, they were originally described as an octopus because of their physical appearance, and eight arms, but they are united by a web of skin, and were later assigned to be part of the squid family. These scary sea creatures can grow to a length of one foot, and their gelatinous body varies in colour from jet black to a pale reddish, depending on location and lighting conditions. It is blue or red coloured eyes are some of the largest in the entire animal kingdom. If these creatures become agitated, they will eject a sticky cloud of glow in the dark like mucus, which will stick to their predators and make them visible to other predators while the vampire squid escapes. In at number 2 we have chimera fish. These fish are famously called the voodoo doll fish because they look like someone took many different types of parts of fish and mashed them all together, creating a terrifying looking deep sea creature. In Greek mythology, the chimera was a monstrous fire breathing hybrid 
invertebrate creature. These fish are closely related to sharks, and to date, there are 50 species of Chimera have been recorded worldwide. Most of these fish can be found in the deep ocean. In depths of over 500 meters down, so little is known about these mysterious deep sea animals because they are so difficult to study, let alone find. The Chimera fish varies in color from black to pale blue to brownish gray and have long bodies with exceptionally large heads. Their eyes are large and translucent with a green color which helps them to see in the dark deep sea. These fish tend to feed on bottom dwelling creatures like crabs, octopi, marine worms and sea urchins. The Chimera crush their prey with their three rows of sharp teeth and like sharks they use electroreception to find their prey in the dark. The creatures are said to have originated over 400 million years ago during the Silurian times but because of today's overfishing they are usually a big target, particularly in coastal waters. These creatures are essential to the deep sea ecosystem. They tend to live up to 30 years old and they also reach sexual maturity late and produce few young so being a target to fisheries is a huge issue for them. If you're ever going scuba diving, I would beware of the predatory creatures, but thankfully they tend to reside in the deep sea. But they are found in oceans all throughout the world except in Antarctica. And finally, in another one we have garbage. One of the most terrifying on this list is the amount of garbage in our oceans. Garbage is ugly and it is a threat to all of us on land and especially those living in the oceans. Whenever you go to a beach, no matter in your hometown or on the other side of the world, on vacation, you have probably seen some sort of garbage or debris floating in the water or on the beach. The amount of waste in our oceans have created islands of trash that collect into massive piles that float on the surface. One of the most notorious ones is the Great Pacific Patch or the Trash Vortex which spans from the west coast of North America to Japan. Last year it was recorded that there are about 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic waste in our oceans and studies expect this number to triple in the next two decades if no significant action is taken. When researchers and divers travelled down to the deepest part of the ocean, which was a record depth, there was one thing that was so unexpected that they saw. This expedition was done by American undersea explorer Victor Vescovo, who was the first person to dive to the deepest points of the Earth's ocean, travelling over 35,000 feet and is the deepest man seen dive ever recorded. During his dive he discovered something truly terrifying and completely unexpected. In the deepest part of the ocean, where no one has ever travelled, a plastic bag was found. Not only are there large pieces of plastic and garbage in our oceans, but it's the microplastic and the remains of trash that are still composting that are more threatening to marine life than anything because they can quickly enter and poison the creatures living in our oceans and even people. The ocean is vital to our survival and the amount of garbage and plastic found in our oceans is baffling and we as humans need to make some serious changes. Well there we have it, I will see you in the next video.